ladies. Sorry. That's all right. I'm calling this meeting to order at 3.32. You didn't read this. Are there any public comments on closed session items? I know, but the, key, oh. the roll call, so Mrs. Snyder. Ms. <laughs> uh, Matoye. Here. Ms. Fleur. Ms. Black. Here. Ms. Yelsey. Here. Ms. Barto. Ms. Anderson. Here. Ms. Snell. Here. Dr. Navarro. Here. Before we go on, I just want to remind everyone we've been requested to make sure that the microphones point to our mouths because they can't hear them when they are here. Okay. And we need to be, I'm just making I've that I've never statement. had anybody give okay. me a hard time about not normal. hearing me. <laughs> I know, but, it's, but, but yeah. when we have it here, too, and if we just, okay. so I just wanted to, it's easier to do it now with mm. all the crowds. I'll do mm. it again. Mm. Now, and there are no public comments, so we will recess into closed session. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. I just made a note to all of our board members about speaking into the microphone. Um, loudly. Loudly. <laughs> directly at the microphone. So, so that we can be picked up and it's much easier for the people that are making the closed captions if they can understand what we're actually saying. Perfect. Um, I'd like to call this meeting to order and we will have our opening ceremonies, a moment of reflection and the Pledge of Allegiance led by S oh, I can't read. Estefania. Estefania. She you. is brand new, so. Well, congratulations. Good <laughs> on you to get to sit in the hot seat. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All righty. Um, we need a motion to adopt the agenda. So move. Second. Moved by Mrs. Black, seconded by, oh, seconded by Mrs. Yelsey. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Okay. Um, I do have a readout from closed session. In closed session, the board took action to accept the resignation of certificated employee 201902HR effective June 21st, 2019, and the roll call vote was as follows. Seven ayes, zero noes, zero absents. Thank you. Um, I need an adoption of the minutes. So moved. Second. Um, Mrs. Floor moved, Mrs. Black seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Okay. Well, we can get started. Before we move to our number 10 recognition, I would just like to congratulate anyone or everyone associated with Early College High School. They were just named at California Distinguished School. Yay. So, yay. Since we are in the mood for good news, I wanted to slip that in before number 10, recognition of our fall sports athletes, Ms. Dr. Bauermeister. President Matoya, members of the board, cabinet, Dr. Navarro, and distinguished guests. Each season of sport, the board recognizes those athletes who have excelled in their area of competition and won a CIF championship. Tonight, we're recognizing one of our fall season champions. The Newport Harbor High School boys water polo team was a CIF finalist in CIF Southern Sectional Regional Championship, which is actually a step above being a CIF champion. Mm. With that, I'd like to introduce Newport Harbor High School principal, Dr. Sean Bolden, to say a few words and introduce his coach. Dr. Bolton. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Bauermeister, President Metoye, members of the board, Dr. Navarro, executive cabinet and distinguished guests. It's an honor to bring our boys water polo team here. They are student athletes, they are students first. They have a jaw-dropping 3.45 GPA. So students first in the classroom, that translates to success in the pool. 
So our storied water polo program has won 18 CIF championships, boys and girls, in the last 52 years. And we kind of lost our way a little bit, but we were able to pry Ross Sinclair, 2003 Newport Harbor High School graduate, away from Corona Del Mar High School, <laughs> where he was winning championships across the bay, back to Newport Harbor, and he restored pride and a lot of energy back in our program the right way. So he along with our boys, had a tremendous season. Our young men just in the pool, in the classroom, couldn't be prouder, couldn't be happier that they're being honored tonight for their incredible season, so thank you. And so Coach Sinclair is gonna say a few words. Thank you, Sean. Uh, thanks, board, for honoring us. Ms. Batoya, you're my seventh grade math teacher at NCAA. Yes. I'm just, very proud right now. Yeah, this, is, this is awesome. One of the best teachers I've ever had, so oh, thank you. That's uh, but uh, we had a fantastic season. Um, we're going to call the boys up one by one. Uh, Sam Allen, Justin Bowles, Trey Genova, Blake Jackson. Hold on, slow down, because we have a, we have a certificate for them. For each, OK, sorry. <laughs> All right, all right, Sam Allen, come on up, Sam. Justin Bowles. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Trey Genova. Come on up here. Come up here. Keep moving up, boys. Blake Jackson. There's going to be a group picture. You know how it works. <laughs> Tommy Kennedy. <laughs> Makoto Kenny. Eli Lathy, Jake Lathy, Ike Love, Johnny Rimlinger, Makana Sanita, Cooper Simpson, Reed Stemmler, Jake Sullivan, and Jack White. And then uh, my coaching staff, Shane Luth, Cody Moore, and Brian Schiefer. Uh, and that, that's the team. But we had an incredible season. Uh, we finished 32-2 and two on the years, a school record for wins. Had a 21-game game win streak in the season. Uh, had a great run at CIF and then ended, ended the season with a bang by winning uh, CIF Regional Division One champs. So uh, thanks again for honoring us. It's a, a great group of boys that represent not only the school but, but this great community. So thank you. Especially exciting for me because three of my kids are in that pool at water polo right now. Yeah. Okay, all right. got them all. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. You make us proud. Um, we've got more good stuff. I like the good stuff. Um, Mrs. Olson. Yes, thank you. President Matoye, members of the board, cabinet, distinguished guests, it is an honor and a celebration when we get to recognize um, our students and in this case, our fine, one of our fine teachers. So tonight we are going to be recognizing one of our teachers with the national, for his national board certification. And so while I'm giving you some background, I'm actually gonna ask Bernard Jane to come up to the podium. <laughs> So 
I think it's important to recognize that the National Board Teacher Certification comes from the National Board for, uh, for Professional Teaching Standards. Um, it's an organization of teachers and other education educational stakeholders who focus truly on advancing the teaching profession and ultimately improving student learning. It has become known as a symbol of excellence in education. It is rare, for example, in our district, Bernard is joining the under 2% within mm -hmm. our teaching staff who have this, who have worked to receive the certification. It is voluntary. It's a rigorous program that includes assessments of portfolio work, um, sets of exams, and it's really based on five core propositions, and that is one, that teachers have a deep commitment to students and their learning. Two, stu <clears throat> excuse me, teachers know the subjects they teach and how to teach them effectively. That they're te three, teachers are responsible for managing and monitoring student learning, which we've been talking a lot about with our mm -hmm. student progress monitoring. And that they think systematically about their practice and they're reflective and they learn from their experiences. <coughs> and lastly, fifth, <coughs> that teachers are members of their learning communities. So Bernard joined us in 2001 at T. Winkle <coughs> in the area of science. He, in 2017, he moved over to Back Bay, which I'm sure they are pleased to have um, his talent and his dedication join the faculty there. And again, as I said, he is joining less than 2% of our staff who have this prestigious certification. And in fact, I will tell you, they've actually increased the rigor and the, e oh. the expectation recently, of which Bernard is a, a part of, in that you used to be able to just renew it every 10 years. They have now upped it to every five years. Oh, wow. So we are very, very proud and honored to have him amongst our staff members and serving our students. Congratulations, Bernard. Thank you. <laughs> Mrs. Floor is representing the board. Oh, I was going to say. Oh, that's Mr. Jane, do you have family here? Please, I just want to say a couple of, of things about the number oh, one about Mr. Jane. The bottom line is that Back Bay Bonavista is, is our alternative ed center. So you really have to have a d deep abiding um, love of teaching as well as a commitment to those students because those students <laughs> are coming to us from different schools. They have a variety of backgrounds and they haven't been successful at their regular high school. And so they come to Back Bay pretty disengaged in the educational process. And it's because of teachers like Mr. Jane that they are successful once again. So thank you so much. Thank you. Very and Would you like to introduce? Come on in. <laughs> Photo up. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. On behalf of the board, thank you so much. I know the rigor that it takes to do that. I didn't want to. So, <laughs> so good for you. Good job. Well, thank you very much. And it's been an honor and a pleasure um, teaching in Newport Mesa all these years. And I look forward to continuing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And is this your lovely wife? Yes, this is my wife, Marisol. Hi. Nice thank to meet you. you. Congratulations. Right. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Alrighty, now we're going to hear from our student board members. Mm. Estefania, <coughs> you get to be first. No, you can just sit right here. That's the beauty of being yeah. up here. Yeah, the big perk. You don't have to get out of the chair. You get your own mic. <laughs> um, <clears throat> an academic update. Several students have completed their credits and graduated early. Um, Back Bay recently had an entertaining staff versus students basketball game where the students took the victory. Uh, Back Bay had a blood drive where over 50 pints of blood were donated and Hogue was very happy with the results. ASB held Spirit Week where staff and students participated in activities such as Pajama Day and Messy Hair Day. Uh, the PTSA is hosting a pancake breakfast for staff and students to encourage attendance. 
and with support from PBIS, PTSA, and Robin's Nest, Back Bay is having raffles of gift cards and other more extravagant prizes for students with perfect attendance and most improved. Thank you very, very much. Alex, you're up next. <coughs> That's not Alex. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah. In for Alex is Mick Hamilton. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mick Hamilton. I'm the senior class president. I'll be uh, substituting yeah. for him because he's got <laughs> tennis practice. So, <laughs> okay. um, Although the second semester has just begun, informational meetings for our AP classes are beginning this week. These are great students and who want to learn more about each AP course and decide if they want to take them. Um, our spring season begins this week with boys tennis having a match against Beckman tomorrow, baseball playing Fountain Valley on Friday, and boys and girls lacrosse having their home openers this week as well. Over President's recess, our youth and government program went to Sac Sacramento for their final conference of the year. A special congratulations to Ben Blackstone, who served as Lieutenant Governor of the program. Um, this week, our orchestra's dance team is performing their cinema uh, themed dance, dance show. This is their largest performance of the year, and the entire school is looking forward to the performance. I'll be there. Everyone's watching. Um, next week, our speech and debate team is heading to the United Nations in New York for an international competition. CDM students will be representing the Czech Republic and will have the opportunity to meet the, with the consulate, sorry, I can't read his handwriting, <laughs> ambassadors of the Czech Republic while in New York. That's great. Thank you very <laughs> much. Nice. Alrighty, and we have Fatima covering for Lucy. Hmm. <laughs> Good evening. Um, like mentioned before, this morning we found out that we are officially a 2019 California Distinguished School. <laughs> Last time we earned this award was 10 years ago. We are very excited as our school will be recognized at the Disneyland Resort on April 5th. Last week we officially became CSF school. We'll, we are in the process of offering CSF application to our eligible students based on their first semester grades. And CSF points will be earned based on the grades, on the grades and courses taken. Last Thursday, our PTSA last, finals, last financial literacy seminar was presented by the Wells Fargo Community Outreach Program. And then last Friday, we had both a living history program on campus, in addition to hosting our first of two um, student shower days for students interested in attending ECHS. Um, we had the biggest turnout of potential students for a shadow day. Our next one is on April 12th. And then tomorrow we will have uh, ECHS information night for any interested students and parents to learn more about our school. It will be held in the NPR from 6.30 to 7 p.m. And on Thursday we will be hosting a Coastline Community College fifth year plan for ECHS students, students presentation. Uh, this will be an op option for ECHS graduates to fully complete freshman and sophomore year requirements so that they are eligible to transfer to a California University with a junior status. Mm. Um, the presentation will be held at, in the NPR at 6.30. Lastly, our school set an all-time high in our school-wide GPA for the first semester, our school average of 3.29 unweighted GPA in all high school, college, and ROP classes taken. Wow. The previous high was 3.2, 3.23, which was achieved in both semesters of last year. We also have currently uh, 34 students who have earned more than 100 hours of community service. Oh, wow. God, that's fabulous. Thank you so much, Fatima. Early college is setting the bar. Okay, um, Jennifer. Good evening. Uh, one of our academic updates is our students involved in HOSA are preparing for the state leadership conference in March at Sacramento. And all our spring sports are starting off, so no update on our sports. Um, the week before we went to Ski Week, we celebrated Kindness Week, and Lean Crew was involved with it. So our Lean Crew leader teacher 
um, dressed up as Katy Perry that day on Friday <laughs> and was seeing fireworks, so it was pretty interesting. <laughs> uh, and that same Friday, our student of the quarter got recognized. <clears throat> and um, our apl applications are available for ASB, Lean Crew, and Lex Lexium Academy. And our future Eagle Night is on Thursday, March 14th. And that's Great. it. Thank you very, very much. Lots going on at Estancia. Rafael. Hello. Um, <clears throat> got kind of sick on ski week. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> okay. Um, a little academic update. AP registration is on sale, so all the AP students have to pay at the ASB window, and ASB is making some posters to remind students about that. An athletic update, a lot of our new season sports have matches this week, like boys tennis, girls lac lacrosse, boys volleyball, and girls softball. Um, we actually have a home ga game today for boys varsity volleyball against San Clemente and a girls varsity lacrosse match against Modern Day at home as well. Some upcoming events, we will have a meeting this Friday for all students to sign up for Greed Wars, an outdoor rally where all grades compete with each other in various games. ASB will go over the games and the times people need to arrive in order to play. This rally will be taking place next Thursday, March 7th. Um, some unique information I'd like to share is our Newport Harbor High School Language Ambassadors, a group I'm very happy to be a part of, <laughs> will be going to Ray Elementary to help translate to families at an Avid Family Night event that nice. will be taking place. Um, on Valentine's Day, the, the week before Ski Week, ASB went to every single classroom and handed out pencils with small um, labels of encouragement to every single student during their third period. I've had a lot of people come up to me and say they really appreciated the small act of kindness. Oh, nice. Oh, that's, nice. Nice. that's nice. Thank you. Thank you very much, students. <coughs> wow, good stuff. And I don't believe we have a Costa Mesa rep tonight, so we'll move right on to Mrs. Waldo, who is here representing Harbor Council PTA since most of them are on safari. <laughs> I know that sounds really good, right? Good evening, President Matoye, board members, Dr. Navarro, cabinet, and guests. It is my pleasure tonight to be here to present to you because Sacramento Safari, a state-sponsored PTA event, is currently going on. We have four members of our executive board representing us up there. Oh, Suzanne Gauntlet, our president, Julie Link, uh, Noel Kruger, our vice president of programs, and Lisa Bowler are representing us this year. And next year, we will get to you the date, hopefully by September, early October, the date for Sacramento Safari next year because we are strongly encouraging board members and superintendents to join us in Sacramento. It's an exciting event. You actually go and talk to representatives. You get some incredible speakers from the government that explain issues to you and PTA, state PTA um, officers as well talking to us about things that, that they're advocating in Sacramento for right now. Our parent ed series uh, next week, March 7th, Thursday night, our next session. It's at Costa Mesa High Library. And we have Dr. D'Agostino presenting on helping your child build character and setting them up for success. Even though we have not been able to accomplish putting the YouTube video of the sessions on the internet, if you go through the NMUSD website, you will be able to get the PowerPoints from our meetings oh, nice. and the notes from our presenters. So at least you've got some basic facts and things like that. Even though you don't have a video, it does give you a lot of information about what's going on. We've Thank been able you. to have that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, let's see. We do have two new PTA presidents. Newport Heights has Rochelle Hatfield, and Whittier School has Diana Longoria. So we welcome them midterm. Uh, our executive board members currently mentor three to four schools each year. Uh, and they go out to their meetings, they work with their officers, they can help train, they get them out of difficult situations, they try and help build their community, and they are the liaison with those schools. So with that said, we thank Ms. Anderson for reaching out to uh, our PTA, wanting to work with our PTA mentors for four schools that are in her area uh, to help try and build more community um, outreach with these schools from Harbor Council. 
Uh, next Monday is our monthly meeting. We are having Dr. Patricia Reba uh, talk to us about promoting healthy lifestyles in children today. She was our presenter at our parent ed se session last time, and so we asked her to come to our Harbor Council meeting. We're really excited because she has a fabulous um, presentation. And last but not least, uh, uh, our invites are going out very soon for our Honorary Service Awards luncheon that will be held on May 6th this year. Uh, oh, and one last little thing. Our agenda for this coming meeting, right now we have, um, we have Dr. Navarro and his cabinet talking about autism and the STEP program. And Vanessa Gailey is going to be talking to us about the LCAP program and testing. Um, we may have to preempt some of our agenda because we do plan on educating our PTA presidents on the current situation with the charter school issue. So, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Matoye. Oops, I'm sorry, Ms. That's Snell. all right. Um, I, I say this every time Sacramento Safari comes up, and I, but I'm going to say it again. We have new board members. It is one of the best trips you can take. Um, they do such a fabulous job, 4th District, fabulous job of, um, of finding great speakers, and um, it's very educational, and you get an opportunity to um, meet with other PTA ledge chairs. Um, there's only one issue I have with it, because I've gone a couple times since I've been on the board, but it's always... <laughs> the Monday and Tuesday of our meetings, so I've had to fly back early. But it's still worth it. I didn't get to go to the legislators, but the just the information you get that first day and, and that morning is really worth it. So I really strongly <coughs> encourage you to go. We can keep that in mind when we're creating our calendar. Yes. Oh, oh I thought about them changing. <laughs> <laughs> well, somehow I feel we have more control over the seven of us than Sacramento. That's true. <laughs> In my experience. No. <laughs> it really has to do with all the, the majority of school boards all ah, meet on, Tues true. on Tuesday on the that's first. That's true. And so, Tuesday, and, yeah. and on Tuesday and Monday is because that's when the legislators are flying in. So the only time, otherwise they, they're taken up. So that's why it's always been a Monday. A Monday and a Tuesday. Fly up on a Monday because all everybody's flying up with the legislators. Mm -hmm. And then on Tuesday because they generally don't schedule things except for visits. Mm -hmm. that's and that's true. And that's typical throughout all of everybody. They all go up there on Tuesday. Seems to be the lobbying day. They're right. all on, you just fly. Well. You just fly home early. It's <laughs> fine. Yeah, you fly home early. <laughs> Thank you so much for being a fabulous pinch hitter. We know we always like hearing from you. Um, a report. Mr. Fawson has some information for us on current career technical education pathways. President Matoy, if I, as Michael's making his way up uh, to, to share some information with you about our CTE pathways, just wanted to, by way of introduction a little bit, um, uh, remind everybody that this is uh, the sixth year that our, our CTE um, program really has been up and running under Michael's direction. And I think what you'll see tonight is an incredible amount of work that's really coming together to create um, amazing opportunities for kids, real college or career. Uh, opportunities for kids. And about two weeks ago, I had the opportunity to, with several of the board members, attend the CTE advisory. And a couple of things struck me. <clears throat> uh, number one, uh, the advisory is made up of, of basically all of the, the partnerships and, and people who make it happen, the teachers and the principals. Um, uh, and the energy in the room was palpable. Um, the energy and momentum behind our CTE programs, really, you can feel it. Uh, when you walk in that room, not only just from the teachers, but by the administrators and everybody. Um, the second thing that struck me are the facilities. And it was at Estancia High School and I was able to, to um, walk through our CTE facilities just at, at, at Estancia High School. Um, and having, uh, you know, obviously was there in the mid 80s, um, looks pretty incredible, um, the <laughs> opportunities that we're giving kids. And then back to that last piece of truly giving kids college or career um, opportunities is really what CTE is all about. 
um, the, the offices and the principals have done an incredible amount of work, not only to make sure that these opportunities are hands-on and practical for kids, but that they're actually aligned to the different content standards um, that, that are in our core classes, so that when kids leave these pathways, they actually have a choice. Um, not one or the other, but an option of career, or college or career. Um, and that's a lot of uh, Michael's hard work and the administrator's hard work. And I think you'll see that in the next few minutes of Michael's report. John, thank you very much. That was a very nice introduction. Um, President Matoye, members of the board, Dr. Navarro, <coughs> members of cabinet, ladies and gentlemen. Um, yeah, it's indeed an honor uh, to, to be here tonight. Um, and you know, as I was going over this presentation, which by the way, um, you should have a hard copy of, of this. And thank you. As well as um, a data packet that uh, we'll talk about a little bit later. Just wanted to make sure before I started that you had that. Um, we've got a great team, as Mr. Drake alluded to. Um, fabulous team uh, with Annie Younglove as our program analyst. Uh, Annie is out there uh, doing incredible networking for us, so uh, has wonderful connections. Breck Lytle, our administrative assistant. Susie Angelo uh, pulls together some data. That data packet that you all have um, is uh, reflective of, of, of her good work. And um, I uh, work on keeping the, the, the team coordinated and it's uh, just a wonderful group to work with. Just a reminder of the drivers was the first uh, part of this presentation. Um, the board priority, uh, this has not, this hasn't changed. This has been around for a while, certainly since we started, and uh, has really set the tone uh, for what we, uh, what we work on. And it's also important to mention, and we, we did speak about this at our last advisory, um, another driver, uh, we pay attention to ZOC Business Council every year and I know board member Fleur gets a copy of this report also through uh, Coastline ROP. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, it's a big old 100 page report. But I have to say, um, this is, it's amazing data and they do a great job packaging the data all about the demographics and OC, um, all about the job availability. And I wanted to, I, I went, I had a little glitch here earlier and I, but I wanna try to see if uh, I can pull this um, data for you. Just want to pull this link up really quickly here. Not I can I can pass these out. To yeah, let me just. I, if this doesn't work, I'm just going to move. Here we go. Yeah. So here's um, and you have a link um, in the in the e copy. You really want to have a look at this, and I, I mean that for everybody in the room. This is great stuff. It's part of it's a little bit depressing too, because you realize that your own kids, how are they going to live in Orange County uh, in certain places? It's just, it's an amazing uh, report. As you go through it, the particular page I have up here right now shows the STEM jobs um, that are uh, available right now in the in the different uh, subcategories. But the report just goes beautifully through through um, every different pathway, every different sector. And when we embarked upon our grants a few years back, as you recall, the health industry and the and, and engineering were two two sectors at the forefront. So it, it wasn't a fluke. It's not just about what the what students want, although obviously you want students to be in something that they enjoy. But it's about this as well, and we don't want to lose sight that this is really, uh, to a large degree, what's driving both um, our consortium in the county, but as well as the larger state, which is bestowing upon us wonderful funding and has been over the last five years, and you're going to uh, hear more about that tonight in terms of what's coming up. They are paying attention, the state is paying attention to the fact that, um, as Mr. Drake uh, prefaced with, this is about preparing students for college and career. This is what this is all about. This is what it's always been about. It's not just about meandering through college and racking up a lot of debt. It's about getting into a career that, um, that students will enjoy. So with that, let me get out of here and see if I can get back in here, hopefully seamlessly. Yay. Yay, Yay it worked. <coughs> Partnerships. Um, first and foremost, Coastline Regional Occupational Program, our, our biggest, closest partner in this endeavor. But um, 
the, the, the very cool thing, for lack of a better word, about this job is you get to um, uh, directly connect with industry and with uh, educational partners, community colleges, four-year universities, um, and that network is really what, uh, what this endeavor is all about, staying connected with all these folks. College and Career Indicator, um, one of the things that, uh, it, it's a wonderful development over the last couple of years to see, is that the state has realized that completion of a pathway should be included in the index, and it is. They realize how important it is uh, uh, for the pathways to uh, to exist, and for our students to uh, to for the districts rather to have as many completers um, as possible going through these programs. So, this is a great development for us, and and I think for the state. Uh, the resolution on here is not wonderful, but what this is is it shows you the 15 sectors uh, for the state, this, uh, the 15 CTE sectors, and within each of these sectors are pathways, just so that everybody sort of understands the overview of, of the structure that we're dealing with. This is a pullout of just one of those sectors, engineering and architecture, which as you can see has four pathways. Engineering design is the one that we have uh, here in the district. So that uh, we have at uh, three of the high schools and uh, are also our middle schools. And here's the snapshot of the district as it stands right now with the respective pathways um, at each of the schools. Um, one thing unique uh, and that we've been applauded for uh, by the county is that our middle schools, uh, we have uh, engineering um, at the at the middle schools as well, and we've got just wonderful. Uh, well, the teachers are extraordinary all over, but at the middle schools, it's really great to see that those teachers step forward and really wanted to be a part of all of this. Engineering design new at Corona Del Mar this year. That's very exciting, and um, I want to stress that, uh, and I know it's been mentioned before. Um, are we supporting, you know, the arts? Yes, we are supporting the arts. We actually have two arts pathways that we need to emphasize. Design, visual, and media arts, as well as production and managerial arts. These, uh, we've, we spent a lot of money as well f with the grants for those two pathways, but I think it's important to, no uh, to note that arts are a big part of, uh, of what we're involved with. Okay, let me, I want to show, uh, it's a very quick video clip that captures, I think, the essence of what we do. Um, this video clip was produced uh, by uh, Estancia High School. So um, let, me, let me play this for you really quick. Estancia High School is committed to ensuring that every student graduates college and career ready. We have created four powerful and unique career pathways that develop students into critical thinkers, effective communicators, and responsible leaders. Our instructors are experts in their respective fields, committed to individual student success. Students in our pathways receive an engaging, hands-on education with full access to industry-leading equipment and technology. step in being ready for the workforce of the 21st century. See your counselor to learn more about the Estancia Medical Academy, engineering design, construction technology, or our digital media arts pathway. I think they did a very, very nice job of that. Mm -hmm. and was this done by a... <laughs> Estancia Digital Media Design. Yes, uh, design. Thank you, <laughs> yes, Board Member Matoya, for reminding me. Yeah, um, Tyler um, uh, Smith, he put together an, a great video. Um, but this does really capture, um, I think it, 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 it captures the energy. But the one thing, whenever I see these video clips and, and we visit the programs, and I know that all of you, you know, feel the same way. You, you're doing hands-on learning. It's experiential learning. It's project-based learning. It's it's those tangible outcomes that 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 the, the students are doing that connect them to the curriculum, and that's 
that video clip really kind of captures that, that energy that's going on at the schools, and this is what makes it all very, very exciting. Um, let me get back here again. Okay, pathway growth um, as of 1819. We got a new engineering pathway, as I mentioned, uh, at Corona Del Mar, and a new uh, digital media arts lab there as well. Costa Mesa High School, new patient care simulation lab, and that to a large degree was done uh, uh, with our partners uh, over at Cosine ROP. We added a fourth year course for engineering design and development at Costa Mesa. Stancha High School, new patient care simulation lab, and if you haven't yet had a chance to visit it, it's pretty exciting. Uh, it's, it's quite, um, it's, it's quite, Yuki, uh, Mr. Yuki is, mm -hmm. is pretty <laughs> excited about it. It's great. Newport Harbor High School, new production and managerial arts film and broadcasting lab. Uh, Mr. John Hoist is the teacher of that program, and, and, and he's very, very excited about that. And we're in the second year course now for software and systems development pathway, or also known as our computer science pathway at uh, Newport Harbor. Ensign Middle School uh, added a full year course of robotics and programming. Todd Metcalf, uh, Bundle en Energy at Ensign, doing a great, <laughs> great job. Um, Fabulous teacher. T. Winkle Middle School, um, they've been at it for a while now. As you <laughs> recall, they were one of the first out of, out of the gate. But they've added uh, computer science innovation and maker and green technology courses. Those teachers, it's a, a team of three teachers there, and they're always looking for um, new things to, to add to their program. So that's a very exciting team. So infrastructure upgrades, uh, got to do a shout out to uh, facilities, our facilities division here. They, they are a, an incredible group. Uh, we partnered on, on a lot of different projects Mr., with Mr. Holcomb and his team, um, and uh, they've been fabulous to work with. But you can see here a, a walk through time from 15, 16, what we've accomplished um, with our various grants and, of course, with our, with our general fund monies as well. This has been, um, and with Coastline ROP. But uh, engineering um, at both Estancia High School and Costa Mesa High School, uh, we had that out of the gate, and, um, and those facilities were, were revamped um, to the, the state that they are now, and they're just state-of-the-art facilities. We've got um, engineering and innovation laboratories at Ensign Middle School and patient care simulation laboratory at Estancia High School. And you can see, I've, I've gone over a couple of these already. For 1819, those are the four uh, infrastructure upgrades uh, that, we, that we've had. And so from a facility standpoint, I have to say when we go to visit, and, and some of the teachers and administrators have mentioned this, they're, they get a little disappointed sometimes when they go to other districts and they see, they see uh, programs that are, that are very, very good, mind you, but they are suffering. They're one of their biggest issues is they don't quite have the facility to house the program. And we've, we've done, I think as a district, a terrific job uh, on this. Continued focus, uh, the biggie is dual and concurrent enrollment. That is um, one of our biggest priorities uh, as, a, as a division, as a district. Um, articulation with the community colleges, uh, our um, OCC in particular, but uh, we're having lots of dialogue about uh, dual and concurrent enrollment, and you're gonna see some stats um, that we pulled together for you in terms of what we have, but we're, we're, we're always wanting to add more opportunities for our students at the community college with concurrent enrollment. Each pathway is a three-year plan. We don't go into conversations with principals about pathways, and I really want to emphasize this point. It's a big commitment. When you, when you take on a pathway, you're not just lobbing in some courses into your master's schedule. You're setting up a sequence of courses that start with your foundational or your participant courses. They go into your concentrator and then in your capstone. Uh, there's three and there's four year uh, sequences. But when you take this on um, as a principal, um, you, what you're ensuring is that you're gonna be able in your master schedule to support that. So if you put your principal's hat on for a moment, uh, you realize I've only got X number of, of courses, I've got Y number of credentials and staff members, how do I make this work? Um, and that, that will always be a challenge, which is what, it, what that means. You can't just lob in 
um, as many pathways as you want. It's not doable. The, the box is only so big. So you have to be uh, picky about what you're going to do and make sure that it's going to be viable and it's something that you can do long term. And as Mr. Holcomb and I have talked about, uh, that you've got a facility to support it. So all of those things have to really come together uh, when you're creating these. So um, you're planning out in advance as much as you can. Um, integrating all CTE courses. Last year, if you recall, I think I, I lost the number, 24, 25 courses that we put forward with the help of our consultants who worked with our teachers to integrate core academic standards into the curriculum. Meaning for our math, our ELA, those standards are integrated into the courses. Um, these aren't separate from the core. These are integrated. That's the whole idea of this, is, is we want that integration and we want it across the board. Industry recognized certifications are also part of this. I'm going to talk about this a little bit more in a moment. Career exploration outreach in the seventh and eighth grades. I, I said it earlier, I'll say it again. We do a really good job of this, reaching out to the, the, to the four middle schools, uh, because again, that's where the interests start to peak. That's where students, of course it starts before that as well, but that's a critical point at which to bring uh, exploration opportunities forward for our students. And of course, teacher professional development. On January 14th, we had all of our CTE teachers together and worked with our consultants um, on such things as curriculum development, integrating standards and whatnot. Um, had a great day and um, that's something that, again, is, is ongoing. All right, a, a quick walk through time. Uh, I, I was, you know, when I put uh, this together with, uh, with Annie, we, when we were looking at this, we were, um, yeah, it, it was a, it's a lot of dough over, <laughs> over, over the years for these grants. But just um, especially uh, for, um, for you to understand uh, what's, on, what's finite, what, what ended, and what's ongoing. Carl Perkins' federal grant, that's an ongoing grant. I, I don't know, I don't know how many years, it's been many years Forever. before me. Yeah, right, 80s, um, is board member floor, I'm not oh, sure. Yeah. But um, ongoing, and that's about the amount that we apply for every year. Uh, in 1415, we got a next ed I3 grant uh, for 200,000. And if you recall, also from the state, we got a career pathways grant. That's really what um, developed the engineering, both at Costa Mesa and Estancia High School. We had three rounds of the CTE incentive grant for those amounts. And the great thing, the great news, is that the CTE incentive, and they didn't, they, I, I changed the word, you probably have the word grant on your copy, I changed it to program because I want, they want to stress, not a grant, not a finite date, the intent is that this grant is going to be an annual oh, no. grant that you apply, apply for. I want to stress, and you all know, you don't need to be told, but I'm going to say it anyways, uh, anything can change in the state, we know that. But the intent is for this to continue. And that is a really exciting thing because quite frankly, we, as of th this June, um, CTE incentive grant was supposed to be done and we were starting trying to figure out, you know, how we're gonna sustain certain things. So that was exciting. And then we also have the K-12 <coughs> Strong Workforce um, uh, Program. And that um, K-12 Strong, or rather the uh, Strong Workforce Program has been at the community college for a few years. Now K-12 is involved. We're involved as a consortium with the county, with pretty much every county, uh, every district rather in the county. And this is also going to be an ongoing uh, program. And we've initially applied for 730,000 over a two year period. And again, uh, another application is going to be coming up for the following two years. So this also is intended to be an ongoing grant. So between Perkins, between CTE incentive uh, program and strong workforce program, we've got three funding sources that, that, that we can draw from to continue the good work that we're doing. Some quick stats. Um, we have a total of 1776 high school pathway students. <laughs> In the middle school, 441. We've got 22% of our secondary students in CTE pathways. 79% are UC A to G approved courses. 81% articulated with OC Community College. Currently 60 CTE students completed the fall semester, this last fall semester at Community College uh, in concurrent courses. 
And our completer data last year was 113 and we're projected for 135. And I wanna stress on completers. When you're going through pathways, your, your numbers are gonna be a little smaller than of course your foundational courses. That, that's, that, that there's nothing out of the ordinary about that. But philosophically, I wanna, I wanna restate that we wanna maximize our completers but by the same token, we all know not every student is going to want to go through an entire pathway. They're just not. But, but if we maximize the participants, uh, the whole intent is to get students just trying uh, these courses, starting off at the foundational level. Are you interested? Is this something that you, would, you might want to continue in? So we're trying to maximize the participants at the foundational level, and of course we're trying to maximize the completers as well. We're really doing both. In your packet, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm losing my voice a little bit here. Uh, in the packet, we have put together for each pathway by site, um, this one pager and what I like about it um, is that it captures for example this one's patient care to stancia it captures the three courses that are involved in their in their sequence so you can see here for the intro beginner course um, it's an ROP intro to med careers and terminology mm. their concentrator is ROP uh, EM, uh, EMR and their capstone is ROP sports medicine We've got the schedule here for the two teachers that are involved in that program. Uh, we show the breakdown between the three courses for the, for the enrollment. And then the last piece here is we show the, uh, pro the um, uh, con uh, completer information and the projected completer information. So that we've, and we use this when we sit with every year and it's coming up uh, later in March with all the principals, we meet with each team. We have the principal, the master scheduler, the counselor involved. And we sit and we look at what we've got and we look at where we're going. Uh, what, are the, what, what courses, are there gonna be any changes? Um, ROP joins us in all of those discussions because of course they're an integral part of, the, of what we do with the curriculum. And when the goal is walking out of those meetings and we know what we've got for the 1920 school year and uh, where we're heading and whether we can support it or not. Uh, also at those meetings we talk about um, uh, the uh, equipment needs, facility needs uh, and try to roll together a plan uh, with respect to um, supporting the school in the best way we can. So it's, uh, the principals have been fantastic to work with um, and they are kind of seasoned with you know, how, we, how we do business now because as you all realize uh, with the, the grants, they have, uh, they have parameters that we, that we follow and they're great too by the way, but we've got to stick with the parameters and uh, have to be very careful to dot I's and cross T's. Certifications, uh, these highlight the ones that we have um, in business finance. You see these three here. Uh, that's not a misspelling, it is Stukent. It is an internet marketing uh, certification. <laughs> Patient Care is American Health Association CPR uh, for food service and hospitality, serve safe and food handlers. Certiport um, brings us the Adobe and Microsoft applications that uh, our intent, our goal, is to have that in place for an end of year assessment for 2019. And then for next year, for engineering, uh, we have SolidWorks on the docket. A little bit earlier, I mentioned the outreach for the middle school. Those are your four. We've had our first one at Costa Mesa, Mesa Middle School. It was uh, really well done. And we've got uh, three more coming up at T. Winkle, Ensign, and Corona Del Mar Middle School. Those are four um, programs that we support through our office. Of course, College and Career Night is our, our big event. Uh, and again, that's targeted for middle school, high school. Orange Coast College Science Night, robotics competition for the district. Um, those are three of our uh, CTSO organizations and as well as we um, support the Summer Engineering Academy. And last, uh, last slide is just some highlights on our uh, career technical student organizations, also known as CTSOs. Um, HOSA at Estancia High School, run by Mr. Yuki, um, extraordinary thing for them is 
they've got 55 students involved mm -hmm. in that in that program and they they pretty much had that right out of the gate in year one mm -hmm. and were accomplishing some terrific things so that was really exciting to see uh, for Estancia. DECA at Newport Harbor High School with Sheridan Hurst. You can see some of the accomplishments that they're pulling together, um, and Sheridan's done a fabulous job there. And, and uh, Sarah Pallone at Newport Harbor High School with FCCLA, and you can see some of the achievements that they have there as well. And I hope I didn't go too far over my allotted time because I know you got I just had a, a big agenda. I had a quick there you go. Question. Yes. Because um, I don't know what the acronyms mean. Oh, yes. And I I even had to make sure I wrote a note for that because I always mess one of those up. The HOSA is Health Occupation Students of America. DECA is Emerging Business, oh, I'm sorry, it's Distributive Education Clubs of America, and it's for emerging business leaders and entrepreneurs. And FCCLA is Family, Career, and Community Leaders of America. And that's what those three stand for. So with that, if any of you have any questions, and by the way, thank you to um, the board members. Uh, I know some of this is a, a repeat from what a week or two ago. Um, we put in a few new things, but I'm so glad that you were able to to, to come to the uh, advisory, and that was it was really good to see you all there. So we have lots. Please. Let's start reverse alphabetically, Mrs. Yelsey. You have Backwards. the alphabet. <laughs> reverse alphabetical. You get to be first. Per per one. Reverse. <laughs> Otherwise, we start with the A's. Um, I just have a quick question. Yes. Michael. Um, now that CDM has the engineering design, and they're the only middle school that doesn't have a program, one we started there. We're 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 working with CDM right now. I really can't um, I, I can't say that that's going to happen for for next year. But we're we're having a dialogue <laughs> about that and what we can because do. Mrs. Yelsey, use your microphone. Know, yeah. Yeah, and, and of course connected with uh, with their um, uh, robotics um, competition oh. as well. So, I, anyways, yeah. Sorry. Thank you. So we're 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 working it work in progress for sure. We just got the sign from from the back. Okay. So, got it. Um, Mrs. Black. Oh. Oops, I should. Well, I'm just all over the place. <laughs> yeah, My choice, say. Mrs. Black. <laughs> Um, I appreciate both of these because you added more information, which you know we're mm -hmm. we're hounds for that, you know, information yeah. and data. Um, but and I'm going to ask for not now because mm -hmm. I know this is. Uh, but I really would like you know the entire board because I'm learning being in Orange County, you know, visiting other high schools that are doing this. The articulated credit, how does that affect us? And then. Um, the concurrent enrollment, I mean, it, it's all over the place. And then dual enrollment, because I know we're just starting. But I'd like to have either a study session yeah. or, you know, because I think it really behooves us to, you know, it, to know as a as a entire mm. board is what I'm trying to spit out, you know, and and I know enough to be dangerous, so I can <laughs> I know who to call and, um, but it, but it's fascinating because it is an amazing and and it's not clearly for, understood, and I will say right. by even folks in in the know, I'm learning not that. clearly understood. For example, differences between dual enrollment, concurrent enrollment. Mm -hmm. uh, really quickly, dual enrollment is a much form more formal <laughs> arrangement with MOUs between <laughs> district and community college. Concurrent is less formal right. but uh, to your point uh, that is something to go more in depth in because mm -hmm. uh, it, there are distinctions with them mm -hmm. and uh, you have to kind of understand that as you're setting the vision going forward is what kind of arrangements right. uh, as a district are we looking for with the community colleges what what will benefit us and our students to the best degree possible so right. and industry too that was the other yes. benefit I was really mm -hmm. amazed so other districts that are a little ahead of us <clears throat> more in that, mm -hmm. you know, um, working with the the uh, industry, and they, it, it's tremendous yes. opportunities for students. I yes. mean, you know, to to walk out of the door and make forty thousand a year out of high school, and then go in to continue, you yes. know, education. And I'm not, I mean, this is across the yes. board, but to help pay for their colleges. And right. I mean, it's just, I mean, that's just one aspect, you mm -hmm. know, of that. Mm -hmm. so, I, I, I would like to say, and I think I'm safe in saying this right now, if Mr. Drake, if I'm not just, you know, um, but in this um, last grant that we talked about with Strong Workforce, mm -hmm. uh, it's that, uh, again, program, I got to get the grant mm -hmm. piece out of my head. 
Um, that is, that those monies are, uh, a good portion of them are earmarked for folks, uh, counselors to mm -hmm. work um, for bridging mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, our capstone courses with the community colleges. Yeah, I, that, I that. <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's the intent. Um, yeah. And everybody's talking mm -hmm. about the same thing. You made a point about the districts that are right. further ahead. Mm -hmm. That's what they're doing. Right. They've got right. somebody out there bridging those conversations, right. those meetings with the community college, because it's a whole different world. Mm -hmm. I mean, community mm -hmm. college operates a, a quite a bit different than, right. than the districts, as, as, as you know. But you've got to have somebody working uh, on that continuously mm -hmm. to pull that together. And some of the right. districts like Anaheim Union right. yeah, um, I mean, with Cypress, they've got a form, they've had a formal arrangement for the last two years and mm -hmm. they are really putting a lot of students exactly. through dual, uh, dual enrollment classes. So definitely well, some that. of our sister districts there to look at and work with uh, more yeah. on that. Michael, I just so. like to add, it's not mm -hmm. just us. We also have to, right, have to have the right partner. Right. And so, you know, yeah. he mentioned Anaheim and Cypress. They were they were the community college was actively That's wanting right. to engage. Well, they are now these yeah. uh, new uh, programs that are coming out, they're actually directing community colleges to engage with us. Well, and that's why, you know, well said, because Orange Coast College is reaching out to us yeah. and sharing, you know, their vision, especially in their different departments. They, mm -hmm. you know, can't wait to tell us. Yeah. And, and Saddleback Valley has also been a leader in reaching out. So that's why Saddleback has right. such a, a plethora of opportunities. Right. No, I'm excited. Thank you for that report, it's oh, great. You're most welcome, thank you very much for having me. Mrs. Yeah, Floor. Close yeah. us out. Oh, you're um, not leaving yet. No, you're not leaving. <laughs> oh, no, but wait, there's more. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> my, some my, of the lights. my computer just starts going, starting, restarting. I mean, it's like crazy. Um, but thank you, Michael. Um, it's really important to, um, for some little bit of background in terms of this. We are a consortium of five with ROPs, but of all those uh, five districts, we're one of the very few districts that actually funds a separate unified career and technical education, college and career department. Mm -hmm. um, most mm -hmm. districts do not have that That's funding right. and do not have that support that this, this board um, and this district does. Mm -hmm. um, you talk to Saddleback, you talk to Irvine, uh, Huntington Tustin Beach, and Tustin, and Tustin they don't. They don't. Um, mm -hmm. And the ROP was always established to provide 11th and 12th graders with classes mm -hmm. um, to, for career mm -hmm. exploration, and now we're moving down. Um, also, to give you a perspective, that it's my understanding at this point, um, we have 150 million that was uh, through O'Donnell, which is 150 for career and technical education. That's the, the old CTIG or the, the grant, mm -hmm. and the workforce was 150,000 that was to go to the community colleges to be passed through to mm -hmm. the K-12. Um, <laughs> Those sort of, that's sort of still waiting to, for everything to be finalized on that, but the understanding is, and then the new, the new grant um, that's coming out. I know, are we applying for a separate, part of the separate, because we're part of the consortium? We are, and ROPs, part, they're applying as well within that, that same but consortium. But it's like, we only, there's only 22 million. 12.5 approximately for the county. I, I yeah. don't have the figure yeah, for right. outside uh, of which we're applying for 730,000 over two R years. Yeah, and then ROP is applying mm -hmm. as, as a consortium, Separate. which our students will benefit. Yes, exactly. Yep. Um, interestingly, also is the HOSA program, because we were all talking about that because at the last meeting, the HOSA, which is they're going on their major competition mm -hmm. up to Sacramento, and they're it's being funded by us and by um, the ROP, right. and everything is funded except for food. Yeah. And I went, food? <laughs> we <get> meals? <laughs> well, according to, I, I the asked, I asked the can. question, mm -hmm. and because a lot of it is coming through Perkins funds, Perkins specifically says you can't, can't pay for food. meals. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's why um, the kids had to be fundraising for their four, you know, four and six meals that they're going to be serving. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of our kids will qualify and we're, they're taking packed lunches. But right. um, again, I will get on the, uh, the horn here. My dream, my ultimate dream is that there is a, we have a building where every student in high school has the opportunity and actually secondary has the opportunity to experience in a work, in a workplace 
um, to take a career and technical education program, mm -hmm. no matter what it is, whether it's just an introductory, just to put their foot in the, you know, I would just love to have mm -hmm. that so that every single mm -hmm. student has that opportunity. But I'll save my other the rest of my report. Okay. <laughs> oh, thank you. All right. Um, I have a question yes. for you. Uh, Costa Mesa Chamber of Commerce has been actively working recently on developing apprenticeships with our local communities. And I know that at one point you were on the mm -hmm. chair. Mm -hmm. I would love it if you could mm -hmm. consider popping in again to those meetings because I do believe that you would be an integral part with our career and college, especially the career part of it, mm -hmm. working with and guiding where these businesses, local mm -hmm. businesses, would like to utilize our students as apprentices. So. Just yeah. as a little, it's Thursday at 10 o'clock, yeah. just in case you have that day. You're ta are you referring to the Education Committee? Yes. Yes, yes that, I would definitely like okay. to, uh, to, to visit that committee. The next yes. committee is Thursday at 10 a.m. at the Chamber Office. This Thursday. I'll be okay. happy to email that to you Please. tomorrow. You may not be able to make it on short notice, but sometimes those little windows open up. So I'd love to see you if you can do that. I did and then we'll get the rest of the dates. And I was on the chamber, uh, the regular chamber for three years. Um, so I've, right. I've, I've done that piece, but you're referring to the education the committee. The education so, yeah. subcommittee of yeah. the yeah. chamber. They, they, they just they, added apprenticeship to that committee. Ah. Right. They merged them. And so to have you there would be a Very good. Yeah. Well, and the ROP has multiple apprenticeships throughout yes. um, with our with our with our with our like I got dibs. harbor <laughs> well the ROP is our students I know that so yeah. like the harbor Boulevard that. of cars and yeah. all of those yes I know. restaurants and yeah. so invite Great. them also thank you right. very much thank you very much very enlightening yeah. I look forward to looking at we all look forward to looking at the rest of the data and the other part and the pathway will be in effect for I next the next the career and college pathway is next or, or have we already Demonstrate, have they already included that on the dashboard? Yes. It's next time or this time? It's on the dashboard. Yeah, it's, it's, dashboard. Well. it's on the dashboard yes. now. Correct. Thank yes. you. Yes. Okay, right. great. Thank Number you. Number of completers is going to be very good. Number of completers is huge. That's yeah. that's a big percentage Probably in graduation then. rates as well as in career and college. All righty. Informational items, Dr. Navarro. Well, I just wanted to kind of take you back a little bit, back to 2012-13. In Dr. Shock is back there. Yes. Uh, so uh, Steve Glier had yeah. Steve Glier had just had retired a couple years before that, and Michael was the uh, business academy teacher at Costa Mesa High School, and uh, the district brought him in part time to lead CTE in the district. You know, and, and Michael was great at doing a lot of great things, but that was a pretty demanding job for him. And then uh, some principal over at Estancia stole him <laughs> to be an assistant principal that following year, and the rest is history so I you know I want you to realize that <laughs> yeah I know yes. yeah. <laughs> virtual enterprise yes there it is yes, yes. Um, but I want you to remember that uh, you know you had a skeleton program at that point mm -hmm. you know the the we just were in the midst of coming out of the recession there wasn't a lot of funding to go in and uh, I came to you and I said look we really need to start a department to do this right to establish this systemically. And so really we've gone from part-time poor Michael wearing two or three different hats, doing, he did a great job uh, and uh, served, uh, and, and you know, was a great bridge for Michael Lawson, uh, when, especially when it came to the Perkins information. Uh, but uh, look where, how, where we've come in, in six years mm -hmm. uh, from uh, you know, the idea of pathways to actually having pathways and establish in all of our high schools. And whoever thought we would get a, a pathway at every high school back then, yeah. except for Dana. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, just a little, you know, yeah. you know this has been a, a, a work in progress. Uh, and the team, the uh, college and career team, along with the support from the Ed Division, has mm -hmm. done an incredible amount of work. Uh, and mm -hmm. we have, uh, you know, we have uh, visionary principals who know how to make it fit. Uh, and uh, know exactly what's going to work in their community and what's what they're what what's going to fit within those pathways where there is employment, because it's very important that when they get through our pathway, mm -hmm. they can find a job. Right. And I just want to remind you that uh, one of your stars from Estancia last year was that two years ago. I don't remember Michael. Two years ago, you know, two companies were fighting over him yeah. to go into a, a, techno a technolo te technology job, and uh, he's flourishing. 
he decided to go with one company. I believe they're paying for his college. Yeah, exactly. And so he's working full time, going to school full time. Mm -hmm. uh, he's earning us, and it's not costing him a penny. So he's going to school on the weekends. Yeah. And yeah. so, so he can work full time, yeah. but the company's supporting that. Yeah. And, uh, and he failed math three times. And he, you know, was thought he was, quote unquote, a loser. Yep. And we haven't said his name, so that's good. But yeah. he, I mean, <laughs> his talk, and now he speaks to other students. And I mean, he just, it, but he's yeah. one of many. Yeah. You know, so. And the last informational piece that is really important to bring up is that mm -hmm. that's why those, uh, those, core curricular uh, standards mm -hmm. are in, integrated into to the CTE way. programs because they make sense to kids then all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. When you're doing math in your engineering class or you're having to write a report in your engineering class, mm -hmm. you bring in the English language arts standards, you bring in the math standards, you bring in the science standards, you know, and, and that's why it's important to integrate those. So uh, we've got a, we've got a, 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 a you know, a long way in uh, in the work that we've done for providing these pathways for kids. No, and thanks for all that. I mean, I, I know it's hard work, and we have so many other things we're doing, but it's pretty. Well, it pretty takes a team. It takes a team. You know, thank Mike, thank Michael Shaka for mm -hmm. keeping it afloat. He did a great <laughs> job, uh, and uh, but he is taking advantage of it now. It ends it. <laughs> you know, his mother didn't raise a fool. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's else? No. Okay, community input on action items on the consent and discussion Ooh, action that's calendar. Me. On action items? Or no? Yes. Community yeah. input on action items. Oh, okay. Okay, this is an opportunity for the public to address the board on action items. Consent calendar resolution, consent calendar discussion action calendar, Per board policy 9323, each individual speaker will have three minutes. Speakers may not cede unused minutes to other speakers, and there is a maximum of 20 minutes of comments per item. With board consent, the president may increase or decrease the time allowed for public comment, depending on the topic and the number of persons wishing to speak. The board staff or members of the public may request that a specific item on consent be, re be moved to discussion action. Requests to move consent items must be received prior to the time the board takes action on the consent calendar. All comments are recorded in full on the meeting video rec um, record. On the meeting <laughs> video record. When addressing the board, it is helpful if you state your name and address for the record. Thank so you. I know. Sometimes better. it's awkward. Um, Mr. Ed Bell. Good evening. Um, the board already knows that I can't talk for just three minutes, but, uh, <laughs> but, but I will try. But you only get three. <laughs> but thank you very much. Um, I want to take this opportunity to thank the board for uh, welcoming me this evening to thank the ad hoc committee who reviewed the application for the naming of facilities for Mrs. Julie Simmons. Um, I can speak on behalf of so many staff and students as to the impact that Mrs. Simmons has had on so many lives, not just students, but also staff. Um, I've been lucky enough to watch her groom students, but she helped also groom me. Um, she got me to wear a tutu on <laughs> dancing with the staff. Um, we won that year. <laughs> and I actually get a chance to use that story for my students to show them that you can go outside your comfort zone and rise and do something that you never thought would be possible. They actually got me to dance, mm -hmm. and this body was not designed for dancing. <laughs> but I can also speak to the fact that she has a heart of gold. She has contributed to so many lives in such a way that it is going to be an honor for Newport Harbor High School to have a dance room dedicated to her for future generations to be able to see how an alumni of Newport Harbor High School can come back and invest in the community, invest in the students, invest in the staff, and make such an impact that she will be known for generations to come in the great legacy and history of Newport Harbor High School. I can speak to the fact that I attended her retirement party that was put on by the dance moms. Um, the dance moms who include Kelly Speth, who I want to thank for helping me put together the application. I cannot tell you the outpouring of love and consideration there. 
there are girls who actually talked about how not only did she help them, she saved their lives. Mm -hmm. She had such an impact and she had such a profound way of bringing the best out in them. Um, I can also speak to the fact that Arrayus, which is gonna be held this year, March 20th to March 23rd, is an incredible show. You owe it to yourself to go. It is a standing room only crowd for four nights in a 499 seat theater. Get your tickets early. You will be blown away. And it is one of her legacies that will continue for years to come. So I wanna thank the board again for your consideration and for the ad hoc committee's due diligence in making this a reality because it's so deserving for someone who is a pillar of our community. Thank you. Thank you very much. John Brazelton. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm John Brazelton, uh, teacher at Newport Harbor High. Um, thank you, as Ed mentioned, for uh, hearing us this evening. Um, having had the privilege of working alongside Julie during her entire tenure at Newport Harbor, um, I witnessed the effects that, that Ed spoke to, but from the very beginning, when that initial seed was planted of getting the dance program started, um, and I was able to see the change take place in the students themselves, um, as well as the school as a whole. Um, our school, well, let me get back to uh, what I've written before I get too <laughs> off script here. Um, so I was able to witness the profound effects she had on countless individual students, the dance program, even the school culture as a whole. Her tireless efforts to attract students to her growing dance program, as that began to bear fruit, I started to notice the positive influence she was having on those individual kids that took that leap of faith to uh, try their hand or feet at dance. <laughs> and uh, the common trait that I began to recognize, or a common group of traits I began to recognize that, that um, really grew within her students was not just the sincere work ethic that uh, she instilled in them, the positive attitude, but a willingness to fail, a willingness to try something that they might be fearful of or not have the greatest confidence in their abilities at, um, but to get out and try and pick themselves up if they, if they did in fact fall down and keep going with a positive attitude. Um, and in addition to that, uh, one of the biggest things I noticed um, reflected of Julie in her students was an openness and honesty and willingness to communicate with other adults that is not something you really see very often in, uh, <laughs> in teenagers. Um, and that just continued to spread throughout our, our school community um, or throughout our student body as her program grew from one small group to then a full teaching load of nothing but dance yeah. classes that were uh, effectively waitlisted um, mm -hmm. And it's, it would be an honor to have her name above one of the buildings on our campus. She's uh, left a profound mark on the school, as well as, as Ed said, on many of the, her coworkers. Um, Ed wasn't the only one to wear a tutu. Uh, <laughs> I, might, I might have as well, but as he noted, it was worth it, we won. Uh, but uh, I know there are others who are waiting to speak, so thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very, very much. Um, seeing no more comments, I would like to move to the superintendent's report, Dr. Navarro. Yes, um, in, uh, you know, we have started uh, a regular uh, agenda item in your reports to make sure we're focusing on academics and progress. Uh, I, when I was absent last time, you heard from our elementary division, the great work that's going on in there to make sure that we're, our students are on track. And we know it's so important uh, that are between kindergarten and third grade that our kids are on track so that when they get to third grade, they're, they're reading, okay? They've learned to read so that when they move to fourth grade, they start to, uh, you know, read to learn. And that's a critical, critical point in, 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 a, in, in uh, the progress of students. And uh, we have many schools that have done so much great work, you've heard it over the years, that it's now time to think about how do we do this systemically? And I think uh, our challenge now over this next semester is how do we take these great practices that are happening in, throughout our district and how do we make them systemic? How do we make sure that uh, the great practices are being used at every school? Um, and sometimes it's, it's not much. It's, it's a mo quick modification or a shift of doing something a little different or maybe even using a different program 
you know, as uh, as teachers are and and and, and site staff are supporting each other and having these discussions about what's working, what's not working, what could work better. So I, I think it's important to know that, you know, we're going to launch this conversation uh, this spring and have it throughout our district about how do we make these really uh, significantly s stable and uh, effective practices uh, go more than just in, you know, two-thirds of our schools or four-fifths of our schools because a lot of our schools are doing this work. It's not, not going to be a big stretch, and I think it's going to lead to a lot of great conversations. Um, and I look forward to the next few weeks coming back to you with, hey, these are the conversations we're having. This is, uh, you know, and we'd like to make sure all of our partners are included and, uh, you know, our HR office is going to make sure that our associations are included in the conversations and our ed division is going to make sure, you know, as you know, John Drake has an amazing uh, capacity <laughs> to make sure a lot of people get their handprints on decisions <laughs> that we go move forward in this district. Um, and that's why he's been nationally recognized for his adoption process because we get a lot of people to get their handprints on decisions like that. So just know that that's going to be a conversation we're going to be having for the for this year. And uh, we hope to come back to you with a lot of great ideas and what we learn from our from our teachers and what we learn together and how we uh, actually push ourselves to think uh, what the next iteration might be and how can we do this better. Thank you, Mrs. Floor. Um, Dr. Morrow, I really appreciate that, and I, I'm looking forward to those conversations. Um, one thing that just dawned on me um, is is how are, how do we engage with our parents? Because sometimes they don't know. They have different ways of how they gauge their kids' performance, and how are we going to meld the two to provide them the information of how how what we're monitoring and what we consider is important and then have that conversation and that dialogue back with with the parents on what they think they need to they need to know on how to gauge their kids at performance Are, yeah. is there a, a plans that have that conversation as well well i could tell you that um that's that's part of what we have to figure out is how do we communicate that but what we have is all the tools in, at least in our uh, elementary division, with right. the amazing instructional materials that have been selected, uh, we can, I, I know what Dr. Sir has shown me a, uh, a, a list or, or, or a um, continuum of standards through each grade level where we know where kids should be and how, where, what standards most important at what time of the year to learn. And we can actually figure, what we need to do is figure out how do we communicate that to parents and say, hey, well, this is what we're on, we're on this standard now, this is the objective, and this is how your student is doing. Are they on target? Are they above target? If they're, or right on target? And how do we, how do we communicate that? So I think that's one of the discussions we're going to have to have. And what tools do we have for us so that we don't have to have every teacher or every principal dot those by, uh, chart those by hand? You know, right. we want to make sure it's efficient as well and effective because we really should be sharing uh, information that's uh, uh, current and give feedback to parents about how, what the trajectory is of their student. And if they're above target, above that trajectory, what are we doing to push those kids higher? If they're below, what are we doing to make sure they get up to that level? Okay, so it is. It's, it, it's, it's, it sounds easy. But it's going to be complex as to how, what is a communication mechanism that we can sit down every time we sit down with a parent. Thank you. I, this is something that the general public thinks we should have always been doing all the time forever. <laughs> Why is this something new and exciting to us? And I know you alluded to that, that in elementary world, that's that type of discussion goes on at conference periods, and that's the focus. Not necessarily where we think your child is headed, but where they've been here, and here's what we expect. How is this different? Because I've had one or two parents ask me, well, don't you do that all the time anyway? So I'd... Well, I think, uh, you know, like I said, we're, we're learning from our schools that are doing this. You know, this isn't something that uh, I'm thinking up. Oh, I didn't think it's that. It's something that we've watched our schools that our principals have and our and our teachers have been exploring. How do we do this? How do we make sure all our third graders are at grade level? What do we what do we what assessments are we using? How are we monitoring that? What are we doing for those kids who are falling behind? Uh, one of the things we have to get better is what do we do for those kids who are above the trajectory level? Um, so I don't think it's anything that we're creating that's new. I think it's how do we expand those good ideas? 
Okay, so we are we have been doing this work. Have we doing have we been doing it for every child through every school? Maybe not. So maybe yeah. parts of it. Uh, mm -hmm. Most maybe most of it. But it'd be really great if we uh, work together to figure out what would be. Uh, what we expect from all of our schools so that all our kids get a basic level of or a guaranteed level of, of, of trajectory uh, uh, analysis. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. Um, consent calendar. I need a mo motion. Move adoption of the consent calendar as presented. Second. It's been moved and adopted. All those in favor? Oh, wait. Any discussion? Do I need to read the disclosure or no? No. You're okay, good. good. No. Thank you. You're, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. Okay. Um, public hearing discussion action. Open the when you open hearing. the public hearing, you call <laughs> that person. Once I open it. So I, first I go to Mrs. Olson. No. no. Yes. You don't have to, but yes. Hi. Hi. Oh, you, it says it yes. says to go to you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> then we will. Such a rule then following. we will. Um, so it is that time of year where we begin to enter negotiations, and so tonight, opening, we ask that you open for public hearing um, for NMFT's initial proposal. This is the third year of our contract, and so this, these are proposal for reopeners, um, and so I ask that you open for public hearing. And Thank you. Public hearing of the Newport Mesa Federation of Teachers initial proposal to the Newport Mesa Unified School District for negotiations commencing 2019-20 is now open. I just love that little hammer. Dr. Dowdy. Good evening, President Matoye, members of the board, Dr. Navarro, cabinet. Um, members of the community. Uh, I'm Britt Dowdy, president of the Newport Mesa Federation of Teachers. Uh, I wanted to let you know that we look forward to opening the negotiation cycle. Um, so as everyone may or may not know, uh, when we do reopen or, or, um, negotiations, uh, there are a few articles that are automatically reopened each year. And then the Federation uh, has two articles that we choose the um, the district has two articles which they choose, and that is what is here before you. Is we're we're uh, letting people know which articles we intend to try to negotiate that we are bringing forth. The next hearing, I believe, will do likewise for the um, uh, for the the district. Uh, so we look forward to this. We are hopeful to reach a, a positive outcome uh, by the early part of May, so that we can have a tentative agreement and then ratify it before everyone goes home for the summer. And so we are going to be working with Ms. Olson to uh, find our dates for negotiation and start soon. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Seeing no other comments, I will close the public hearing. I can do it next time. Oh, I am so sorry. I didn't That's all right. Know that I could speak in any of the next three. Oh. <laughs> um, I'm oh. just wondering, um, based on your comment about wanting to get everything resolved by May. When do we get um, the health and benefits numbers? We anticipate the JBT will receive um, those numbers in mid-March where we can start okay. looking at Good. plan design and recommendations from that committee. Okay. Thank you. Uh, just for the public's knowledge, the JPT mm -hmm. stands for the Joint Benefits Team, mm -hmm. which is comprised of members of uh, the Classified Association, the Certificate Association, and administrators. Thank you. All right, our, our next item of business is to receive the Newport Mesa Federation of Te Teachers' initial proposal to the Newport Mesa Unified School District for negotiations commencing 2019 2020. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved by Mrs. Flora, seconded by Mrs. Black. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Thank you. 19C, public hearing of the Newport Mesa Unified School <laughs> District's initial proposal to the Newport Mesa Federation of Teachers for negotiations commencing 2019-2020. I open the hearing. So as Dr. Dowby <laughs> shared with you is that now that this we ask that you're opening the public hearing for the district proposal of um, 
for our negotiations. And again, this is reopeners, and so there are the standard articles that are open for for both are Article 12, which is salaries, Article 13, health and welfare benefits, which is also linked to Article 16, retirement benefits. And while the um, Federation opened Article 8, which is class size, and Article 10 for traveling teachers and special assignments, and they're looking at clarifying the language in both of those, the district has opened Article 3, uh, days and hours of employment, proposing to review the service days related to student-free days, as well as to establish a collegiate calendar for 2020, 2021, 2021, 22, and 22, 23. Also, uh, we are opening Article 6, evaluation. We are proposing to update some evaluation forms and review conduct and the so we ask that you open the hearing. Thank you. Mrs. Snell has another. Did you have? Did, Mrs. Snell? Yeah, that, was a, that was a knee bump? <laughs> no. <laughs> you didn't turn it off. <laughs> Thank you. Um, hearing no other further comments, the hearing is closed. I need a motion to approve the Newport Mesa Unified School District's initial proposal to the Newport Mesa Federation of Teachers for negotiations commencing 2019 2020. Mrs. Yelsey, is there a second? Second. I'll second. Oh, Mrs. Bartow? Oh, yay. Dana went first. No, 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 no go okay. ahead. Okay. We want to have someone else <laughs> on right. the minutes. I, I second. <laughs> Jump in. That's how I feel, too. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? 7 0. Thank you very much. Discussion action <laughs> calendar. Do we have any further? No, we didn't. We got them all before. Do you want to do this? Um, you can do it. I am moving this to Dr. Navarro and Mrs. Floor, since sure. I'm on it. Hmm. Uh, so, here, you read it. I'll, I'll just explain. Um, every year we... Uh, we all have copies. Region 15, which is Orange County, uh, selects our delegate um, members who represent the organization at our annual meeting, and they are charged with uh, voting on our policies and voting on our um, an ag our agenda of how we're going to uh, attach, attack some of the issues that are um, dealing statewide, as well as selecting the, uh, the leadership um, of that year. So um, every year we have, they serve a two-year term in the delegates, and we have uh, a listing, and they've all been provided the recommendations. And I'll turn it over to Black, Mrs. Black, because some of them we know, um, some of them we don't. So. So I'm, I'm hopefully I'm going to present um, a ballot and then um, a recommendations and then if if we agree then um, we would I would love to see a motion to approve. So the first person that we're recommending is Bonnie Castry and she's from Huntington Beach Unified, our Union High School District. Um, Ian Collins from Fountain Valley um, School District. Jackie Philbeck from Anaheim, um, and that's at elementary school district. Carrie Flanders is from Brea Olinda and their unified school district. Karen M. Freeman from Pl um, Placentia Yorba Linda and unified school district. Al Jabbar is from Anaheim Union High School District. Our very own Charlene Matoye from Newport Mesa Unified School District. Um, Susie R. Schwartz from Saddleback Valley Unified School District, and um, Edward Wong from Saddleback Valley Unified School District. Hmm. If you're in yes, Can I, make a motion? Sure. Um, I move to approve the slate as delivered I, by Mrs. I want to sorry. I want to discuss. I thought we were voting for this individually. I'm not comfortable voting for it as a board at this time, so I'll be abstaining. I, I you don't want to break them off, um, but we sub, we only submit one ballot with with it's only one uh, one ballot. Slate. If you want to, okay. it's a slate. But if you want to ask any questions, we can we can give you some information about those indiv the individuals. Well, I don't feel prepared to do that right now. Oh. So I'm okay. Okay. Yeah. I sorry. I also want to abstain because I like to do some research, and I I didn't realize that this sure. is what I was going to be doing. Um. 
this is for the deadline to, to do this is today. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Right. So, so, they're, so they're just going to abstain and they no, won't have a voice no in this. We have to. We have I'm, to. Vote. I'm not declining. I just don't. Yeah. Right. Right. I just wanted to make sure that mm -hmm. this is the, our right. only the only shot. To I mean, the only the information was provided in the in the thing which was the, their balance statement. That's the only. That's the only information. Right. I thought we were voting individually. I thought we were each able to do it vote. yes so for me like there's there are some people on here that i would vote for some of those i've never even heard of them and i didn't i don't know that much about them oh, and i, guess so I just don't a, feel comfortable and, collectively and actually we're absolutely comfortable because all of these pe people are it's, it's like we know some of them the ones that we are <laughs> but we them. we've done a lot of the research so if you have any questions on on rationale we'll be glad to provide you that documentation on that that information Right now, we can. If you have a question on any of them, um, uh, the reason. Well, I'll just I'll just give you some information. Uh, David Boyer um, is on Los Alamitos board. There is currently already a member sitting on that board, um, mm -hmm. and he's a long-term member but hasn't been really involved. Bonnie Castry is very involved. Uh, she is a, a certified mediator um, and has served on the Huntington Beach Union High School District for. A number of years. Uh, Gina Clayton Tarvin um, is on Ocean View uh, School District. She was at one point served as a delegate and wanted to return. Um, we just felt that there were other people that are a little bit more qualified um, in terms of some of the showing the, up <laughs> more the demographics. Um, Ian Collins is with Fountain Valley, a great person. Uh, Jackie Philbeck. Anaheim Elementary School District is one of the largest elementary school districts in the state of California. They have over 21,000 students. And the last time they had a member was Jose Moreno, who is now a city councilman mm -hmm. in, yeah, in, in Anaheim. Anaheim. And Jackie has, um, we're recommending her because she has been also worked as a, an advocate and a policy person with a state assemblyman. So we thought that that would provide a great opportunity uh, for the delegate assembly to get to know, and um, she comes with a wealth of information. Uh, Carrie Flanders is on Brea Olinda Unified School District, another <coughs> uh, unified district, but hasn't had a lot of representation in a number of years. Um, so, and that in the northern county, they t mm -hmm. tend not to. Um, Karen Freeman, longtime uh, school board member. Elizabeth Gonzalez, brand new school board member, don't know too much about her. Um, but only been on her board for two years, and so we were a little bit concerned about that. Um, Al Jabbar is on Anaheim Union High School District. Uh, again, a longtime uh, member of that board. I think he's only been about five years, but um, very involved um, with Anaheim. Chester uh, Yang, didn't know too much about him. I, um, I called about him. Um, to find some information. This is his very first year. He was just elected, and generally we like to get people a little bit acclimated uh, <laughs> to being a board member before jumping into we'll this. I think you know uh, Charlene Matoye, uh, same thing. Um, Xavier uh, Nguyen, um, Westminster hasn't had has had a couple of members on the board, and I don't remember where they have still. They, they just don't. One. They don't attend. They haven't office. attended. Uh, Susie Schwartz, longtime member of the Saddleback uh, Valley Union High School District, very involved mm -hmm. in Orange County School Board Association, and Ed Wong. Um, they um, both Saddleback used to be entitled to two appointed members because of their size. Um, now they don't. They don't qualify. They don't meet that threshold because they've lost over, well, they used to have 35 and now they're way below that. So they're at 32. So they don't have an appointed member. So that's why they have two openings. And we, so those were, the, those were the nine. Yeah, so for me personally, like two of those, like I would vote for Gina and I would vote for Elizabeth Gonzalez. So, okay. the, the, and those are the two people that I definitely, re so I just, I don't, I would like to abstain at this point. No problem. I don't. No we, problem. we have a motion. We do need a second before we can even proceed. I seconded. Yeah, I just wanted to discuss first before. Yeah, sure. No, that's, no it's usually motion, second, discuss. So, yeah. but that's fine. No problem. <laughs> We've got motion, second. And there's also and we'll other continue discussing. <laughs> well, and I think that if you look at it, these are just the nine. There are eight. There we are the largest region. Mm -hmm. So there's there's a there's ton more. of more people yep. that are already on the region. There's we have 27 members on on our region on our delegate. So they they're up next year. Oh, and 
<laughs> what? I saw it on. I turned it off because I thought I hadn't turned it off before. So, Mrs. Snell, <laughs> now you can talk. Okay. And by the way, we can't hit it with our knee, uh, um, Ms. Anderson and I, because oh. we will get cut because it's Ours all are broken. Our buttons yeah. fixed. Um, okay. You mentioned uh, Westminster. Um, do Westminster, do they have a representative? Uh, you said to, they I don't have to, come I have to or look something. again. Uh, um, they have in the past, um, the member who was on the Westminster board, I think was Barbara Michelle, and she chose not to run. So they had, they've had, they've had recent um, representation. Same thing with Centralia. They've had recent representation. So we were looking at individuals that haven't had um, the district because you're, uh, you're representing the entire right, region, right. but they hadn't had a represent, re representative in a, in a while, okay. so we wanted to make sure that we were looking at trying to make sure it's balanced. That people had, except some people have more than one. What? Some uh, like yes. districts have more than one, so yes. that's why. We'll, we'll have, have two because of large. our enro we'll enrollment. Actually, we have three. No, well, well, I'm not a member of delegate assembly. I'm not considered a member of delegate. She's a assembly. lifer for life. I know, but I'm, <laughs> I'm saying a, we have your voice. Oh yeah, you have my voice, but I don't. I don't even get to. This is the only time I get to vote. I don't even get to okay, vote. Okay, so <laughs> your reason for Gina was uh, she's only been on two years. Oh no, no, Gina. Gina, has, Gina has which served. I'm getting mixed she's up. She's on yeah. the Ocean View uh, School District. She uh, she has been a member of delegate assembly um, two years ago. So she oh. went off. She went off. Is there anybody else for Motion View on there? Um, no. I don't believe so. Not with the elementary school district. Not with that elementary school district. Okay, and and so it was Xavier Nguyen that's only, which one, I, oh no, Chester. Chester, Chester Jen has only been on a there's year. Another one, there's another one too. But. And Xavier doesn't show. Well, no, we, we just, oh. there isn't. <laughs> Oh. So Westminster's had had has had, had, some had challenges. has had had well Westminster <laughs> yeah. has had people on the on the delegate assembly previously. Okay. Well, I know you two are uh, you three, no you two, yeah. Judy's not here. I know Judy's not. Here. <laughs> but um, are experts in this. Um, I read through that they all have pretty good resumes. So yes, they I'm do. gonna I'm I'm gonna um, go with your recommendations. I'm just waiting for more discussion and then I'll I have no more discussion. I think in the future as part of like new like I for we need more information so like if I knew this is what we were going to be doing and that it was just we were going to be deciding it like in this process I think we would have both had different responses. Right. I, I'm sure that so. I handbook people put that in, put that in the handbook. Yes. Yes. So I, I do board member protocol, add it to the book. I'm sure your recommendations mm -hmm. are excellent. I, and I That's think fine. especially Charlene, I would highly recommend. Mm -hmm. Thank but you. Um, I, I don't feel comfortable unless I do my own research. And I sure. didn't have a chance. Okay. Well, and there's several that are appointed, and we don't okay. have a void. We don't, we don't have a voice on appointees. Vote, vote on those. Right. Okay. okay. Are we done discussing? I want to make sure everybody has a chance. Okay. It's been moved and seconded to approve the delegate assembly election ballot as presented by Mrs. Black. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. Aye. Aye. Okay, it's 502. Thank you for your vote. Mm -hmm. I appreciate <laughs> that one. Um, okay, approve the facility naming ad hoc committee mm. recommendation regarding request to name the Newport Harbor High School dance room the Julie Simmons home for dancers so moved my pleasure whoops we, we do have we need to bring to up to speak to mr. Shaka dr. Shaka um, dr. Shaka you're here and also Dina Barton so who is speaking <laughs> <laughs> don't you love it yeah that's Thanks okay because that's what Dina. that's what he did when she wasn't there. <laughs> I deserve that. I'll, I'll make this very short. I think you heard uh, some compelling rationale as mm -hmm. to um, why Julie Simmons is very deserving of this uh, fantastic honor. So, um, President Matoyer, members of the board, Dr. Navarro, distinguished cabinet, um, we would ask that um, you approve this this nomination. Uh, we saw in in our. Uh, fact gathering that it was a unanimous vote. We got positive comments across the board. The only um, 
not positive response was some some ideas to wordsmith maybe a little bit, and then we <laughs> thought that might um, might lead us astray. So it was a, a, a very positive experience we had. That's have. great, excellent, perfect. Okay, perfect. Um, I second the motion. Okay, Mrs. Floor <laughs> moved, and Mrs. Yelsey seconded. Any discussion, board? I think it's exciting to have mm -hmm. someone yes. that's so respected by the community mm -hmm. and has made such an impact on children. All Are we going to have a ceremony or something? I don't know. We should. There should be dance shoes involved. Nope. I'm sure that obviously I'm two sure, I'm sure Newport happen. Harbor is going to be planning something. Invite us. I want us. to see Ed again in the tutu. There you go. <laughs> there you Ed, go. John. No, we don't. <laughs> yeah. I want to see this. <laughs> I've seen the gold lamé pants with, Def, with Dr. Bolton, so I figure I can do that. And you can't unsee that. On the last night of the Oops, wait, wait. Oh, perfect. Oh. We need you to come up and say that in the microphone. Oh, good. More time. <laughs> Before we vote. Sure. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, on the evening of March 23rd, that'll be Saturday evening, starting at 7 o'clock, that'll be the final performance for Reyes. Get your tickets early because it's standing room only. Uh, there's going to be a special recognition. It's going to be in the program, but we're going to make a special recognition that evening and bring her out on stage. Trust me, it will be standing ovation because she is most deserving. So I welcome you to enjoy us on that evening. Get your tickets early. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded. No further discussion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Yay. Abstain. <laughs> the Julie Simmons Home for Dance Yay. will be there. Yes, See, good stuff happening. All righty. Um, Mrs. Gailey, we have approving the Low Performing Students Block Grant Plan. Somebody speak before uh, you. Just real See, quickly. They as, left you as, off every time, Mr. That's Dirk. quite all right. Um, and it, it'll be short uh, from my perspective. Whenever it comes time to putting a plan together, there is one person oh, yeah. that we always call on, uh, and that would be Vanessa Gailey. So what did I do on my um, vacation time? Pardon me? What did I do on my vacation time? I actually read this. All 322 pages? No, oh. no, I still skipped through some oh, of it, you know. Oh. So I have, this I is have just never a done a, plan, a whole really, 300, this but, is. but it's um, great. So let me just load this up real quick. I have some slides because I, I want to clarify a few things and just make it um, as easy as possible to understand. While you're this. loading, I'd like to thank all the district staff that's taken the extra effort to have the PowerPoint ready enough for us to have I, a printed copy. Yeah. We all appreciate having Very that. Much. Very much. And it should be extra easy to read because we made it nice and big for you. Yes, you did. Yes. Mm -hmm. no thank you for respecting our. <laughs> We're not quite to the 72 <laughs> font size yet. Thank you. So, uh, President Matorier, members of the board, Dr. Navarro, cabinet, and esteemed guests. Um, we're here tonight to discuss the Low Performing Students Block Grant Plan. Uh, this is a new plan, um, but before I dive into this particular plan, I want to explain its context and within all the scope of the other plans that we have going on in our district. So the first thing I want to do is um, stress how the, this uh, little bitty plan is related to the big granddaddy plan, which is the local control and accountability plan. And our um, LCAP is, uh, is an existing document that each year we add on to and update, um, and it's a three-year plan. So we're currently in the middle of that plan. And uh, the Low Performing Students Block Grant funding came about um, in September, October-ish, and so um, we started hunkering down and trying to look at the data. But really, the reason why we're um, presenting this plan separately now is because it needs approval now. Moving forward, it will be embedded into the LCAP, right. so you won't be seeing a separate low-performing really? students block grant plan. So we're just presenting it um, in its external context right now. Okay, so let's go back and review my favorite and yours, the Local Control and <laughs> Accountability Plan. Um, a reminder that it's a three-year plan. It's a requirement for all districts in California, and it aligns our district budget to the plan. It's very transparent, and it's presented alongside the budget um, each year in June, and it requires board approval by June 30th. 
Remember that um, the plan um, was born because the state changed its funding formula to the local control funding formula. And most districts receive funding through that mechanism with a base dollar amount for all students and then supplemental funding for students that have particular needs and have historically struggled. And that is students who are English learner, low income, foster youth, homeless students. And they're called the unduplicated count because what happens is even if you're a student who's in multiple categories for those funding purposes, you're only counted one time. Okay, so the LCAP, the Local Control and Accountability Plan, is designed to address the needs of all students and then to explain how additionally we're providing supports intended to help the students who traditionally struggle. Our LCAP has eight goals. And these eight goals have been consistent for the last few years. Goal one focuses on English language arts and English language development. And goal two focuses on science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. It's these two goals that we will focus on when we talk about this low performing students block grant. So in English language arts and math within the local control and accountability plan, we explain a couple of tiers of support. Our first tier is considered our core, and that is essentially the, the instruction that we want for all students to have access to. They need to have access to that core, and some students struggle to have access to that core, and so they need supplemental supports, typically called tiers two and three. But remember, it's really important for our kids to all have access to that core, that high quality tier one. So um, I've highlighted here some components of the LCAP, specifically in red, to draw out your eyes to some big ticket items <coughs> in the LCAP, how we really focus on tier one for all, and then we also offer additional supports in tier one and in tiers two and three. Traditionally intended for the kids who are struggling the most in here, but you don't necessarily have to be in these groups to have received supports. We support all of our kids who have needs. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we wanna make sure that's really clear. Okay, so now we're gonna get into the low performing students block grant plan. Uh, that doesn't read as nicely as LCAP. It doesn't, <laughs> and, it, and it's, it's not an acronym, yes. It doesn't roll off the tongue. Not so much. No, but so um, our low performing students block grant is um, th these funds were intended to serve students who are identified as low performing on the state English language arts and mathematics assessments. That's the smarter balanced assessments and who were not otherwise identified for this supplemental funding under LCFF. So what does that mean? It means students who are low performing and who are not low income, not foster, not English learner, and uh, additionally not um, eligible for special ed. So really the thinking here was that there may have been students who were unserved in certain locations and we needed to provide additional funding to make sure that we're wrapping around those kiddos as well. So in Newport Mesa, our total grant award is $913,360, and the grant deadline expenditure is the 2021 fiscal year. What we're allowed to expend on are evidence-based services that directly <coughs> support the kids, and it can include, but is not limited to, professional development, instructional materials, and additional supports for students. Hmm. So... What does that mean for us in practical terms? So we have to look at students who have smarter balanced assessment scores. And so we grade, we administer the assessment to students in grades three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and 11. And the funding is based on students who have a score of a one in ELA and a one or a two in math or scores of one in math and a one or a two in ELA. So you have to have a one in one category and I'm gonna get into that a little bit more later. So the initial count that we um, were received funding on was 466 students. But when we're looking at our data, we think that um, it's probably more like 511 students in current year, and I wanna explain that. We believe our friends at CDE did a great job, but we think their data is insufficient. <laughs> First of all, we think that SBAC is the floor, not the ceiling. So it gives us your first blush at an indicator, but it doesn't tell the whole story. So it's the start. It also leaves out current 10th and 11th graders. So if you're an eighth grader, your test results come around and we see them when you're in ninth grade. If you're a 10th grader, you don't have new smarter balanced results because you took it back in eighth grade. <laughs> Same thing for our current 11th graders. You took it back in eighth grade. So the, the money that was doled out to us did not include that smarter result, smarter balanced results for those kiddos who were left out of the equation. So we went back and worked with our assessment team and came up with an eligible for funding purposes pool of 511 students. 
Okay, so these are the counts. This is purely the strict funding definition. You can see elementary schools on the left and secondary schools on the right. And what you notice wow. is that there's not a high concentration of students at, um, at any of our elementary schools. 13 spread out through fourth, fifth, and sixth grade at Kaiser. And so, you know, you're not seeing here the distribution of those students. Um, Lincoln, only 10 students. You go down to, you know, the kiddos <coughs> who have one. Anderson has one. Pomona has one. So you have to kind of ask yourself, okay, remember, there's a context already of interventions and supports being applied. Now, what might we do for one child, three children, et cetera? We're not just going to pull them aside and give them their own separate intervention. Okay. Same thing for our secondary schools. When you're looking at our secondary schools, you have a high concentration at Corona Del Mar Middle and High. It makes sense that there would be more students at a school with 7th through 12th grade than at a school with only 9th through 12th grade. And so again, you see the kids who fit the strict eligibility rules of not low income, not English learner, not foster, not special ed, and also scoring a combination of the ones and the twos. So the gives, this gives us a grand total of 511 students. Um, but again, we, you know, we wanted to step back and take a look at, that's, that's the money, but what do we also do to think about what's the need? So I just want to show you that um, when we built our dashboard to try and look at the number of students, we, didn't, um, we kept it in context with the other students as well. So that we're really thinking about, well, what are the numbers of need at one particular school? Because you're probably already having an interventionist or a class. So what can we do that's um, complementing what's already existing? And what can we then add to it? So as you can see in this chart, we have grades four, five, and six. And these are all the students who had a, grade, a score of ELA one and math one. <coughs> these are the lowest performers. And that gives you a sense of the concentration of students. So you see at our um, elementary schools, it's really no more than three kids per school of kids who have a one and a one, again, who fit this eligibility criteria. When you look at the students who fit the unduplicated count, you see much higher concentrations, as we would expect, right? So just to give you a sense of we're keeping the whole picture in mind as we're thinking about our plans. If you look at the combinations of a one and a two in English language arts and a lowest level of a math one, again, you see the numbers rise. Um, there's our one kiddo at Anderson now. <laughs> right, and then you see that goes all the way up to seven students at Kaiser or at Newport Heights. And again, the higher numbers over at the um, unduplicated count as we would expect. So then when we add in a math level two, and you see kiddos who struggled on the English language arts did slightly better on the math, you see the numbers fluctuate again. And so this one though has some overlap in that, remember our definition wasn't a two and a two. The money was about a one and a one or a two. So if we were to say to ourselves, well, if, if they thought that a one or a two is the indicator of what may be indicative of, of struggling, then why would we not ask ourselves, who is all, what's the mix of kiddos who are ones and twos in both categories? And that should be our master eligible for intervention list, but we're still going to figure out the money according to the strict guidelines. So I just want to you know, tell you that we're looking at the strict funding, but we're also looking at what would make sense to intervene for our children. So we're really recommending to keep this in mind as, um, as the sites are moving forward and looking at their targeted supports. So um, that was the elementary picture. And of course, we wanted to provide you the secondary picture as well. So back to the one in the one. And you see that um, our, our highest number, again, is at Corona Del Mar Middle and High. And again, students in grades 7 through 12. And then, um, but you also see that there is a greater number of unduplicated students at every school over on the right-hand side. So that's, again, the lowest performers, one in one. Now, I also want to point out to you, when we brought this data to our secondary principals, um, especially the ones at the... Um, at the grades 9 through 12, um, they made a point of reminding me that not every one of their students um, takes the Smarter Balance as seriously as some other kiddos. And so what they wanted to do was really review the list and say, I want to know who really has need and who kind of blew it off because maybe they were paying more attention to the AP test. So um, we also wanted to take a look at that because we are not going to put a student in an intervention that they don't actually need. And then this is, this we'll show you the combination of the English language arts ones and twos and the math. Again, notice the contrast between the two sets of um, students. 
and then the English language arts one or two and the math two now getting into that overlap of um, some kiddos are actually not technically eligible for the funding, but 176 kids at Corona Del Mar Middle and High School would not be what everybody may think. And then finally, this is the ultimate set of um, the intervention eligible list that we've provided to our, teach, uh, to our um, schools to start combing through and thinking about who already is receiving services and what else might we add. And so um, all of the secondary schools have received their lists and are currently combing through them with their um, counselors to take a look and see what's existing and what might we add. So let me tell you about the plan components. What we have to have in this plan is the increased or improved services that we intend to fund, what metrics will we use to measure their impact, and then how does this align to the LCAP? So as I explained before, um, this plan focuses solely on goals one and two, English language arts and math, um, obviously coming from um, the, the dictate from the funding source. And again, remember that we already are focusing on our tier one instruction. We still want to augment that tier one instruction and do the very best we can that first go around so that we don't have to remediate later. And then also really consider our tier two and three direct services to students. So what does that mean in practical terms? For um, English language arts, what we're looking at is training and instructional materials to support students' reading comprehension skills in um, elementary small group reading interventions. Um, a number of our schools are already using leveled literacy intervention, and it's a very small group approach. The kits are expensive, and so some of our schools have purchased one kit or maybe two kits. And so we may come to find that at you know, Mariners where they have nine kids, they may need two more kits and we would then be able to use some of this funding. In addition to the kits, you have to know how to deliver this very targeted intervention. So we've also built in the costs of the professional development. Secondary reading classes. Um, this would be something like Read 180 um, or Reading Plus, and we have both of those existing in our district already. We're working with the sites to determine what's the best delivery model. With Read 180, we would be looking at funding both the section of the class as well as the expensive initial year, which includes um, three days of professional development for the teachers as well as on-site coaching. For the math side of the house, what we're doing is training and coaching for certificated staff, our teachers, to really provide that quality first instruction in mathematics. You know, math is so different now from when we all learned it, especially um, when we're thinking about what fluency means for children. And so um, that's a lot of change for teachers and for, um, for our interventionists to get their heads around. And so we want to make sure we all have consistent understanding of that. We're also going to have support through consultants to conduct data analysis to identify students' unfinished learning, meaning they just haven't learned it yet. So what do the kids not know? And we've heard a number of times from our teachers, we need to understand how to differentiate. Well, we want to make sure that the teachers are differentiating in their classrooms based on data, and we're not just farming kids out to an intervention class. How are we intervening in the moment? What tools and strategies can we use based on what students have learned or are yet to learn? And then finally, strategically planning those units and lessons to target that differentiation, helping teachers to identify what the kids don't yet know and what are the things they can do to continue to support that. So what are the metrics? The metrics you should know, um, recognize as very common already from our local control and accountability plan and our ongoing conversations about how we monitor our students and being on track in our system. So we're looking at things like the elementary star IRL. It's a reading level equivalent, an independent reading level. Um, the Dibbles Next, that's a foundational skills. Some of our older kids are still struggling with the foundational skills, so we may need that. If that's not their area of need, then we won't need to use that. English language arts unit assessments, um, their, their grades, we'll take a look at their grades, as well as, um, of course, the smarter balanced assessments. And on the um, secondary side, you see that um, those metrics are mirrored. For math, math unit assessments, math grades, and math um, smarter balanced outcomes as well. So finally, we just want to remind you that we're really looking for a balanced approach when we're delivering services. We're trying to you know, bring in, um, the, recognize all of the need on our campuses. We recognize we have students in the unduplicated count, and we recognize we also have students that fall outside of that. We want to make sure that we're really doing as much as possible to support high quality first instruction as well as intervention when needed. And we do have the tools to monitor and report on the data, and we will be looking closely at this particular group of students as they progress over the next few years. 
So just a reminder in a commercial that the public hearing for the local control and accountability plan will be June 11th. It'll be an exciting night. <laughs> We're going to be color coordinated. <laughs> <laughs> and the local performing students block grant will be embedded in that plan. Um, and then the board approval, anticipated board approval, will be June 25th. Great. I welcome any questions. Fabulous. Miss, uh, anybody? Oh, there we go. Oh, there. there they come. Okay. <laughs> Mrs. Flora, you were first. So I want to go back to your comment about um, um, the rationale that Corona Del Mar may, in fact, be um, having so many kids because they sort of blow off because they don't that take That was it one serious. hypothesis, hypothesis from, from so I just want some to, I administrators. Just want to, yeah, I want, <laughs> I want it proven. Um, <laughs> one is, I guess the question is, is that as you said it further on down the line, the assessments have changed. A lot of them are more performance-based versus an, a, an advanced placement test, which is a lot of rote and a lot of members, you know, a lot of, I, don't know. I mean, it's pretty hard, but there's not a lot of, is, is, there, is there more performance based in the advanced placement tests? And, and are all these kids in advanced placement tests, and is that why they're blowing it off? Or is it because they really don't have those foundational skills and are actually, so gives me concern when it says, well, let me have the names of the kids so that I can make a judgment call on whether I would want to make sure that you insist that they prove that, that the kid is not, um, is blowing it off or, or doesn't meet the criteria. Because I'm concerned that, well, let me have the kid. Oh, no, you know what? I know that kid. That kid just blew it off. Huh? Maybe he doesn't have the foundational skills, or maybe he has a tutor who is t tutoring the, I, I don't know. I just, mm -hmm. I, I have concern when we all of a sudden sort of say, we'll blow it off because they're, they're, they're taking something else more seriously. That, well, that seems like we're just sort of passing the buck and not really honing in on, on so, other stuff. So I just want the data. I agree with you, and maybe I misspoke. I, nobody said that all of the kids were blowing off the assessment, okay. but there was a hypothesis that some of the 11th graders at these particularly high-performing schools may not take it as seriously as some other ones. So we want to test that hypothesis always, and that would be why we would look at these metrics to trust but verify. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you. Mrs. Snell. Okay, a couple questions. Um, so... The only, I'm, I'm looking at the, um, the beautiful little chart here that tells how many students per school uh, meet the criteria. And the only students that are counted are the ones that took the SBAC the year before. Is that what you're saying? No, we used our new and improved data for this to come up with the 511 students. That, so we took all of the most recent SBAC scores. Okay, so if you're, um, if you're a ninth grader, you're going to take the eighth grade. If you're a tenth grader, you're going to take the eighth grade score. Correct. I see. Okay. Correct. So we went back in time for those. Okay. Now, um, how do, so how do we measure the success of the funds? Do we have to report that to anybody other than our own people? So what, what we intend to do is look at these metrics that uh -huh. we've proposed, and uh -huh. we're going to look at this cohort of kids, and we're going to compare year over year. Their SBAC scores would be the indicator yeah. I think the state would be looking for, but we would also be looking at more of these internal measures to see what the success was. Because we might have to wait a few years for them to take that test. Correct. Too. Okay, so... Um, uh, so that's how you would, so is there another measurement like the next year when we do the LCAP, we have um, 380 students that fit into this category. Is that considered as well or is it just this cohort? No, we will be looking at um, the, the current cohort and mm -hmm. the new cohort. So essentially what we'll do is we'll, we'll uh, label them in our systems as different cohorts because oh, you may have kids good. who fall out, okay. like you're saying, and we would want to track that, um, that 
growth over time. So if a kid suddenly got a three and a three, we want to acknowledge that because that's sure. a success. We don't want to lose them as a success story in the final year. Okay, and in the LCAP, this, the block grant will be separated, so we'll know which monies. So, yes, so the, the way that I, um, the way that it was constructed in the um, actual plan mm -hmm. is consistent with the formatting and mm -hmm. style of the LCAP, and so we will add it as additional actions. So even though they're only numbered actions one, two, and three, um, the way that the LCAP is structured, we have to put them at the end, which mm -hmm. is not the way I would want it. I would want it to flow intuitively, but I'm not queen yet. So it's just <laughs> you will have be. to go at the end of the section. <laughs> and and on your attachment, that it that's the way it looked. And I, I yes. thought maybe yeah, that it was, was purposely the way. done that way. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Mrs. Anderson Ms. Anderson. Yes. Um under the plan development it says substitute release time for professional development for teachers to provide quality first instruction in math. Yes. Mm -hmm. Tell me more about that. And mm -hmm. are we gonna be building into that also um some remediation of kids that did not get first best instruction. So there's already helped? remediation going on, right? We'll need to keep that in context. But one of the things we're really trying to do is make sure that we're having teachers be able to um, intervene in the moment in their classroom. Mm -hmm. And um, I will say that the, the majority of the interventionists, their time is eaten up with reading. Yeah. And so there's not a lot of extra time for math, but some of them are doing that. So we also have to look at available staff on hand because there's not mm -hmm. enough funding to pay for new additional teachers. Okay. So the substitute release, it's not, that doesn't have anything. It sounded to me like maybe that was happening on Wednesdays. With the, no, that's not substitute, totally that's early release. So well, for no, no, instance. No, no, I just was like the verbiage is similar. Yeah. Is that the same no. thing? Substitute Are these, release what is substitute time? release? No. It's like really three mean, days yeah. or for, for a lot of our teachers, um, at the, currently we're doing a facilitated planning model and so they get like a half day. You don't really need a full day for that kind of work. So depending on what our teams develop, we will look at what's the most efficient use of time and substitutes. That is also a limited sub source. Is that like the November 1st day or? No, what? that doesn't require substitutes either. That's a student free day okay so this is a it means actual substitute correct we have to pay gotcha. for the subs and then the teachers come out and okay. they do the training okay mm -hmm. what else mm -hmm. mrs. Bartow okay um, two questions okay um, well maybe I'll have more but starting with two <laughs> uh, uh, what have you, or as a consideration, just looking at the different schools that I've visited and um, parents that I know, how does this relate to maybe a school's willingness to do an IEP? I'm curious, uh, as I look through the different schools, I'm wondering if um, some of those interventions could be part of a school's different approach to IEPs, just just from the different principals I've talked to. Um, just something to consider. I have no basis in data other than anecdotal, but um, just something to look at when you look at a school that's maybe got a high um, group that's, that's not reading at grade level. Is there something underlying where they're trying to do intervention separately? And I don't know. It just, it seems a little um, just, I mean, we can talk more at length, but I just okay. feel like based on the different parents I've talked to at lots of different schools, uh, it kind of aligns with maybe Oh, people saying things like, well, I can't get an IEP no matter what, is, hmm. is something I've heard. So you're thinking that it's possible that students are being under-identified for IEPs and then it categorized in the this? Yes. I think we would definitely need to explore that. I, I just think, in terms of that perception as well as the data behind right. that. I, I My think, understanding is that we're not on a downwards trend in IEPs <laughs> in our district. No, totally, so. and, and I, I've totally seen that. I'm just saying from what I've heard parents say, uh -huh. um, I think it'd be worth exploring. Yeah. Well, I definitely think that we will be, one of the things that this is allowing us to do is look at students um, in a small group of students on a case by case basis. Mm -hmm. And so this will help us to really kind of take a look at the stories of each of the students here because it's a small group. Right. And then I'm sure we'll be able to come back with um, additional discussions. Right, Dr. not, not, Dr. A, not a pressing thing, just something to put in your, your yeah. back pocket as you yeah. kind of explore. Okay. Um, and then the other question was. Okay, wait, uh, wait. I'd like Dr. Jockham oh, to oh, speak sorry. to oh, this yeah. first. Thank so, you. Um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to convince Vanessa to come work in student <laughs> services. So the more you talk to her about IEPs, it's just a natural fit for her to come and can work over in student services. So, um, <laughs> right, Vanessa? <laughs> I love working with the entire team here at New yeah. Mesa. <laughs> so, so, wow. 
Uh, so I would, I'd be interested in having a conversation maybe um, offline about uh, if there's particular schools or parents that are feeling that there is a, a um, kind of a requirement, not kind of, there is a requirement in the law that says you have to try all general ed interventions prior to special education. So that, that doesn't come into play with students we know that have a very obvious disability, but for students that are um, often learning disabled or other health impaired, um, we try and do general ed interventions. We know research shows that the more you're in general ed, the better you're going to do. So. Um, I, I'm, I don't want to hear that people can, don't feel like they can get an IEP, but I'd rather have people feel like they're getting help, whether right. it's through an IEP or something else. So um, we can definitely yeah, uh, follow I, up with you on that. The people who I've talked to, I feel like, and it's three or four different schools, kind of fall into that gray area, I feel like, in their minds where it could be maybe they don't understand the process, maybe they really want an IEP and they are better off getting the intervention in general ed, or maybe it's truly a perception coming down from the um, school site where they are pushing that to the side. I, so it's it's probably like a, it's great that it's like so illustrated out by people because I feel like who can actually really solve that problem because mm -hmm. um, I probably know like 15 people on that list and can say, okay, this is that perception. Let's do uh, some research. Maybe, and I would site. like to be on that um, <laughs> offline conversation also because I'm hearing the same thing yeah. um, from me parents. Me too. I, I so, think this would give more data to the student study team when they're yeah. when they're assessing whether someone needs to be ready to be brought up for an IEP. But Having this level of intervention uh, again gives even more data to decide. You know, wait, this type of intervention is helping. This isn't helping. So maybe we do need. I think I, that would think give that, more. And, data and, part of it. and both ways, right? So if yep. the parents right. really determine that they need an IEP and maybe it's not a good fit for or what they or actually S need. Or just a plain ordinary SST. Right. We can say, well, the data you're... shows that actually you're better. You know, I think, it, I think it'd be good both ways. And you had more questions. Oh, more. my other question. Sorry, that was a very long question. Uh, my other question was, is this, I'm sh is this available somewhere in Spanish? No, I not yet. So. We'll get it approved first and then we'll <laughs> make that happen. Um, but the LCAP is available in Spanish if anyone wants to check it out. Oh, hot dog. <laughs> dub, 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 I, I, I read it forward in English, slash LCAP. Spanish is <laughs> in Spanish? Yes. It is. It is. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> no. And then one last quick question is, have we identified the curriculum that we're using for remediation? Um, Look, scrolling through, it looks like there's so something. So we've, we've used some permissive language, like such as, because we want to have a little flexibility, especially if the sites. But what, what we are committed to is consistency and equity in our district. So we're not going to have people go too far outside the norm. We're really thinking the LLI seems to make sense, that being that a number of schools are already using it, it's been cost prohibitive to some. So if they're not going to intend to go that route, we're going to have some very in-depth discussions about what evidence-based approaches they're intending to use. Thank you. Yes. LLI. Leveled Literacy Intervention. It's a Fountas and Pinnell product. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Any other questions? All righty. I ask that we have a motion to approve the Low Performing Students Block Grant Plan. Well, I guess. Yes. <laughs> okay. Mrs. Floor agrees to do it. Do I have someone who agrees to I will second. Mrs. Barto Yelty. agrees Great to job, second. Great job, Vanessa. Thank, Thank you. you. Although we haven't Great voted job. yet. We might change our mind. <laughs> Great job, Vanessa. I don't care. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstained? Yes, we passed. Yay. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. Okay, Thank Vanessa, you. where is it again? Because I'm on the school website, and I, uh, the district website, and I just wanted to check it out. And I, uh, the I've, the I've, I'm at the home page, and it says about us, enrollment, departments. So uh, I'm scrolling down. You, and I, I'm scrolling down. I am oh, scrolling down. It doesn't show me anything. Just, I just was curious because I typed in local accountability plan and it what didn't else? come up there. Are we in home? Here's yeah. home. I just want to know, just curious. Well, I know you because know, I at DLAC we talked about it. So. <laughs> I just want to see where it is. Okay. Thought it was oh, there, here it is. She, she found, found it. it. Got it. Okay. Now it's, it's right. Now she had to go home. On the right hand side, mm -hmm. English and Spanish. Mm -hmm. This is flyers. There we go. I'll cap. No, Perfect. Don't Thank you. Okay. Our welcome. Our Public Information Office has done such an outstanding job of making our website way more user friendly. Yes. And we're so used to having to to do like a mystery day to find out the solutions in order to find something on the website that now when it's so nice and easy, we, 
We're excited. Yes. yes. Thank, thank you so much for thank you again. Thank you. Report. We look forward to seeing you in a minute. <laughs> All righty. Yeah, really. <laughs> Still moving on to <laughs> policy. That, oh boy. See, I knew we were so excited. I just would like to, for the public's benefit, and some of our board members, um, mention that the board has a, a has for the last most recent years since I've been on the board, we have a successful practice of having three members of the board totally tear <laughs> apart and discuss and down to the final commas or no commas or Oxford <laughs> commas or is it Cornell commas? I don't know, but we Oxford. discussed that in the meeting about all policies before they do come to the board. So you don't have to. So Because we would do that here. We hope. Yeah. We, the, the people on the board would be doing that now. And it's a good six hour meeting for a nut like what we have 10 Great Ten well. policies. <laughs> um, the modifications that we have made or have agreed upon or have brought to the board today are from the California School Boards Association legal team. They alert us that they've laws have changed. Our staff then really picks apart in any given policy to make sure that if there's something could be tweaked to make it updated, to make it more relevant to Newport Mesa, we do that. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the policy editing team, like I said, rips it apart and shreds it and says things like, what does that mean? If we don't understand it, how could the public, somebody else reading it, understand it? Um, follows, following and, and everything's in line with the law. Following the edit team's work on the policies, they were emailed to our board on February 14th as a sweet Valentine present to our board. <laughs> you got policies to read. The, with the idea in mind that we would have the full President's Week break to peruse them. <laughs> and also they were attached to the agenda last Friday when the board agenda was posted so the general public could see it. So tonight, oftentimes with this, we're asking most likely for it that we waive the second reading because we've all had so much time to read it and be able to approve the policies as submitted. Then, just so you know the process, any policies that are approved tonight will be sent to California School Boards Association, CSBA, for processing to upload to our district's gamut, and gamut is the name of our agenda program, um, and the online policy manual. Back in the day, there's many of us that remember, every school site, every facility had the board policy board there, and it was two five-inch binders thick of policy. Mm -hmm. So we are totally grateful to have this online representation because you can search and find something so quickly. And then we will meet compliance timelines for our upcoming federal program monitoring review. That being said, <laughs> Dr. Navarro. Mrs. Mate Mrs. Yes, ma'am. Oops, I'm so sorry there are lights. You want to talk about red and um, <laughs> I just wanted to add um, that um, for the most part, um, the way it should be is everything that was in the in the um, policy before is in black. Thank you. And everything that is new is red. Correct. For clarification. Yeah. There are a few in exceptions in here, but for the most part, it's right. Ms. Anderson. Um, I would like to Oops. not waive the second reading. There are a lot of things that were taken out rather than editing, and so I actually have a lot of concerns about those. So I would like well, to have a tonight's second. Tonight's the time to. De we're not determining whether every policy gets way. We take them individually. Mm -hmm. It's not. At, it, this is not a slate. Mm -hmm. This is individually policy by policy, mm -hmm. and this is the time for the board to discuss any questions or concerns on those policies. Mm -hmm. So when we get to that point, we can hear from the people so, who have information. To satisfy that, um, can we take and vote on each individual policy? Yes, that's what I said. She just said I didn't think you said that. You said so we usually do. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, Thank you. I'm sorry. Sometimes, I thought you didn't say I did, that. You I just did. said rate them all. No, we take we, them individually. There's moved in second on every policy as okay, an individual perfect, vote. Perfect. Good. Great. Okay. That being said, Dr. Navarro. Okay. So I am your master of ceremonies, <laughs> uh, and uh, we are going to do this in three parts, uh, and we're going to bring Vanessa back up. She has four policies. Go up and do it now. Okay. 
So this evening I'm bringing f uh, four policies before you. Uh, the first one is a new policy um, so that we have um, a policy around our local control and accountability plan. And this policy is referenced by other policies. Um, I'm going to see if I can reduce the size yeah. a bit here. That's okay, can we all see that? Okay. So. We have copies. Yes. Yes. Perfect. So I'm, I'm not sure, I, I don't want to read this all to you, but I, I'll summarize it. And if I hit a spot that, um, that you feel like we need to slow down, um, I, I'm happy to do that. I think that's probably the most efficient way to go through this. And essentially, um, the, the first statement is a statement of purpose, which we're looking at. Um, we're trying to use all of our available resources to make a common sense plan for all of our students, and that we use um, data to drive that process. And we do identify our goals and then align it with the budget. Uh, and can then, I interrupt for a second? Sure. So if we have, um, if somebody has a change, should we bring it up when you get to that paragraph? I think so. Okay. Does that fit everyone's experience? Uh, that yeah. sounds good. Okay. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> and then um, this will reference the other um, policies that, are, um, that this is referring to. And then also you'll notice all around here we have education code. So a lot of the language of this is um, placed, taken directly from the law. And so essentially um, we have a local control of accountability plan that we have to use according to the state template. And it has to address the state priorities. And we do. And then we update it on or before July 1st. You notice that I said we had to have the um, board approved by June 30th. And then um, it's updated and this is all of the requirements according to ed code. Then there's the description of unduplicated students and um, then the numerically significant student groups and there's um, requirements in statute about what constitutes the different group sizes and then this is the listing of what unduplicated means and what numerically significant means. Any questions? Um. I would like to add in that LCAP should focus on improving academic outcomes. I think if we're continually drawing the focus back to that, it's very important. So right um, under where it says the budget. So if you go back up and you look here, um, the LCAP shall focus on improving outcomes. It's not limited to academic. It's a beyond that. So for instance, one of the, the things that the LCAP looks at is the social emotional supports and the school climate and student engagement. So this is not limiting. I think of it should be limited. And then it, it, and state priorities are the eight. And so mm -hmm. academics is one of the state priorities. And so that's already covered in the priorities. It's required. I mean, this this language is exactly what the LCAP is supposed to be. Th that language, improve outcomes for all students, is what it says in the LCAP. Correct? Yes. So this is it's like including but not limited to, and so the yeah. state priorities, including the academics, right, is just it's, one of them. It's academic yeah, I think. It, well, I think it should just. I think it should be expanded, but just besides just improving outcomes. Okay, so we'll note that, Don't move on, and maybe come back to it for discussion. Because um, sometimes what happens is as you progress through the plans, you see other things that are um, mentioned. But really, um, academics is included in all of the priorities. I just think it's big. There's also a comma change. Vicki is reminding me that I, there's a, after SBE, the, there should be a space after the comma. And mm. it's not because it's justified. Page. Page, on the first page. Page one, We're first paragraph, second, paragraph. Second. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Page, Sherry, do you see that one right here? Right there. Page A, that? second yeah. paragraph, second line after State Board SBE. of Education and then the um, acronym SBE. This is why I wanted to be to on the, the editing team. <laughs> I understand. Um, this is justified. This is justified. This is this has yeah, to do with how, how it, because no, it's unjustified. No, it's not. No, it's not. No. There, there yeah, needs because to be there's space. Because there's a space. justified or not. Well, there'll be room to space it there. All right, so um, moving on, um, the next piece component um, addresses the school plan for student achievement. Um, it was formerly called the single plan, and um, according to Ed Code, we need to make sure that there's a relationship between the LCAP and the single plan, or excuse me, school plan. I'm still using the old language. I know. And so here is where we say that this will be aligned to other district and school plans to the extent possible. So as these new, this gives us um, uh, flexibility as new plans come forward for things we may not have thought of, like the low performing students block grant and anything else that comes along. And that also is at the school level should 
a, a new requirement come about. <clears throat> And so this piece has um, the requirements around the timing, and so that's why in our public hearing we have this separate. We have a separate public hearing. We do our presentation on the budget and the plan, and then at a subsequent meeting is when we um, adopt. So this is kind of laying that out according to education code. And then the next piece is about complaints. Um, people can file uniform complaint procedures or uh, uniform complaints following the uniform complaint procedure around the local control and accountability plan. Any questions or comments on that thus far? I've lost you. Where, where the note they're on to page the board B. Piece of it. Say that again. The note to the board piece of it. That's next. That's next. That's next. Okay. I'm on plan development. Page okay. and paragraph. Yeah. Got it. I found you. The second yeah. paragraph. It's the next paragraph. You haven't talked about it yet. Yeah, but, but may I ask the board members? The reason that we kind of say, "Where are you? Where are you?" First of all, Mrs. Miss Anderson, would you make sure your mic's where you? Okay. Secondly, it's because. Mrs. Snyder has to make these corrections on the master, so, so it behooves us to make sure we get her directly to the spot so she can get there fast enough to keep up with us. That's why, that's why we were going page B, paragraph two, yeah. line 14, seven letters over. It's really special. You should, <laughs> our, those meetings are really fun. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, so I believe we're in the middle of page B. I'm gonna continue down here. We're in plan development. Mm -hmm. All right, so this is the piece where we're in plan development, where we're gathering data and information, um, and this is where we're having to rely on the information from the dashboard. And so it doesn't say that there, but that's essentially what it's saying, that we're looking at disaggregated student data and information about current programs. And then this next piece is about the board consulting with um, required groups and consultation. And the reason why we were seeking legal clarification is we wanted to know whether the word consult was required. And so in con um, communicating with legal, they said, yes, this is directly from education code, so um, the word consult needs to stay. So the, the question was about consultation. Um, we got further clarification from them on what that consultation means, and that is outlined in the next sections, um, including what happens at the public hearing and what happens with the various groups. <coughs> so one method of consultation is the public hearing, and the other methods of consultation are laid out. We were concerned because when you read that it says we'll, concert, we'll consult with principals, administrators, mm -hmm. other school personnel, mm -hmm. employee bargaining units, and the board, by virtue of its role, is not does not consult right. with those individuals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But and their so, clarification is that we consult through advisory committees. Yes. And through public hearing and public through the various hearing. mechanisms. And it's also implied in the way that you look at the student piece around the student forums, student advisories, and the surveys as well here. Okay. Okay. All right. Did that answer your question, Ms. Anderson? Yeah, I just wanted to know what the legal clarification Yeah, was. exactly. We, we wanted to make sure that um, we knew exactly what we were getting into there. And so <laughs> with the public review and input then, um, these are all of the required um, committees and groups that we must consult with. So we have the superintendent's parent advisory that works with us um, on our LCAP and a number of other issues. Um, the, the next paragraph, the when, whenever district enrollment includes at least 15% English learners, that's our district English learner advisory committee, DLAC. And one of our co-chairs is here this evening, so <laughs> it's good to have her here. And then the um, superintendent or designee presents our LCAP to the committees, and then we take their questions and respond to them. And then, of course, we uh, make sure that the members of the public have an opportunity to submit their comments about the LCAP and um, participate in, um, in the process. We also work with our um, local SELPA, and um, additionally, we have a community advisory committee with our student, um, parents of students uh, with uh, receiving special ed services, and so they also have an opportunity to provide their input. And then this little piece is kind of convoluted, but essentially what it's saying is you have to have a public hearing, and it has to be the LCAP first and the budget second on the public <laughs> hearing. The same time. That's the same, same time. Day. So that's public hearing. We will hold at least one public hearing to solicit the com recommendations and comments of the board about the pieces of the LCAP, and it has to be held at the same meeting. So the LCAP meeting and the budget meeting are um, at the same time. Then the adoption of the plan, that's the next section, and I'm currently on page D. 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 Thank you. 
So on page D for adoption, this is now the adoption of the LCAP and it has to occur prior to adopting the budget. So in sequence, we have you adopt the budget um, after the LCAP and that would be June 25th of the coming year. So Vanessa? Yes, ma'am. If the board felt that they wanted to have a greater understanding of the LCAP or a, wanted to make available to a, at a public hearing, does that, would that require that Jeff has to agree and so that because both of you have, if we want to have an additional public hearing on the LCAP, we would actually have to call for an additional public hearing on the LCAP and the budget? I would so think there yes. Would be two. If you're having a public hearing, I think it has to be together. Has and to be you wouldn't two. want it divorced because the whole purpose is to have one okay. inform the other. That's what I want. Okay, yeah. perfect. Thank you. Okay. So um, the, the next piece is also about um, revisions to the LCAP and what would happen if we had some material revisions. Um, and then the submission to the county superintendent of schools. So once you've approved our um, LCAP and our budget, then we, within five days, have to submit it over to Orange County Department of Ed for them to review. And then this lays out the process in statute where by August 15th, they need to respond to us either to say congratulations or to ask for more clarification. And if it's not approved, then they have to let us know why, and then we have to accept um, some technical assistance. The next piece about monitoring progress is a new <coughs> component for the state, and that's really um, how they're um, looking at providing technical assistance and intervention with the LCAPs. Um, so um, there's an evaluation that's um, including but not limited to the California School Dashboard. And so just in January, districts were identified for levels of district assistance. Um, our district was identified for support. We had one student group who fell into the mostly red category with one orange, and those were our homeless students. So as a district, we're currently looking at all of the supports and services that we provide for our homeless students, and then looking at what we can do to support them, and that will be written into our LCAP. So a little bird walk from the, this, but I want to make sure you knew about it. So um, essentially, this is all of the components required for the technical assistance between us and the county superintendent, or there are other groups that um, we can apply to if we choose not to work with them. <laughs> and so these are some of the things that they can assist us with. Um, and that's really just about them coming and meeting with us and looking at our data. They've already held some county level meetings. And so um, this is explaining what happens if you get identified for support. Um, the California Collaborative for Excell Educational Excellence is an alternative to working with the county superintendents. And then essentially these are the things that would have to be done if we need intervention, like revising our LCAP, revising our district's budget alongside that, and then um, this decision to stay or rescind any district action, et cetera, um, for the, um, the student groups. Okay. Other questions? Do we currently use, I mean, I think this is a, I know we use a ton of consultants and I would personally like to see us not use so many consultants if the county is providing assistance for academic programs and practices mm -hmm. for identified areas of weaknesses. Mm -hmm. Do we have a list of what we're currently using from the Orange County Department of Ed and how we tap into that? So the Orange County Department of Education provides a number of services. I can speak to that because I was employed by them. So <laughs> one of the things that they have here is required in statute and that's not something that we would have to um, pay for. Mm -hmm. They have to provide the services for LCAP. There are other services that they provide in the content areas and PBIS, et cetera, that are sometimes for fee or low fee. And then there are other consultants that we use. This particular piece is specifically talking the, about the supporting the LCAP and supporting mm -hmm. us in the areas where we've been identified on the dashboard. Other questions or um, items that we need to address in this? Um, Policy. No. I move to approve this policy. Um, 6020. And I'm sorry. No. BP 460. Yeah, got it. Okay. <laughs> Do we need to wait for Dana? Oh, did she leave? Do we need to wait for Dana to come back? Yeah. We're taking intermittent breaks. We're taking. Oh. <laughs> Because she didn't call a break. So I didn't call a break. I should have called a break before we did this. I apologize to the board. That's fine. Um, I'm sure it'll be fine. Well, I can make my motion. You can still make your motion. Uh, yeah. So we'll second it. Uh, first reading. <laughs> Hold on. Are we, are we, are we, my motion, my motion is to... I'm telling you, so much feedback. My motion is to approve 
uh, <coughs> policy BP0460 and dispense with the second reading. Is that, that, well, I was waiting for that, Mrs. Yelsey okay, to wait for her you. to second, second what Mrs. One. Snell actually said. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Discussion about the motion. Mm. And it, honestly, well, I, mean, I, I think okay we went reading. through it, and so I just wanted to make uh, okay because of Ms. Anderson's. And earlier. this is the first time we've had this policy, and um, I'm I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong. I know you will. Um, <laughs> that um, you can bring a policy back and make Absolutely. changes at any point if you don't if uh, things change, mm -hmm. or um, mm -hmm. and we do, which is why most of the other ones. Are not original, and that's our responsibility to do that. When Absolutely, I'm sure that this one will be changed because um, as it moves forward. I'm sure Mrs. Black, Mrs. Black is fine. If we move and seconded, all those. In, oh, yes, without on the first, pass it on the first reading. Right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Absent. Well, just catch her, on, catch her on the way back. <laughs> <laughs> on the way back. Well, and honestly, honestly, it's six, six, <sighs> zero. On the way back. Oh, she's going to come in. Everybody's well, staring ask. at her. Mrs. Black, it was Take moved and back. seconded <laughs> to adopt this policy on the first yes. reading. Okay, 7 0. Thank you. Okay. One down. Oh, okay. That's how, that's how it was with us in the editing, <laughs> thing, too. Okay, that that Thank you. No. Okay. Thank you. So we are now on the second policy. This is board policy 6020. Mm -hmm. It's about parent and family engagement. And um, a number of changes um, when No Child Left Behind was reauthorized as the Every Student Succeed Act, there was a change in language around parent involvement, which became parent and family engagement. So one of the things that we wanted to do is make sure that this policy reflects that change. Um, also ahead of our um, Title I review for federal program monitoring. We want to make sure that we have absolutely the up-to-date language um, before the reviewers um, take a look at our policies. And so again, um, as I believe Mrs. Snell explained, um, the components in black were there prior and the components in red are pieces that we are um, adjusting. And so what you see here is basically, again, the statement of purpose about recognizing the importance of family engagement. Parents and guardians um, are, are um, a key element in that. And so we wanted to also then <coughs> take out the word involvement and use the word family engagement wherever possible. And then um, you'll notice that we um, adjusted the language from working with staff to consulting with parents. It's a nod to the, the way that we're trying to um, work with our um, families. Um, and then minor um, changes um, that I don't think really um, adjusted the, the meaning of, or the meat of that purpose statement. Are there any questions about this initial paragraph? Okay, you'll notice that we have strike through on a number of po um, old policies that are no longer relevant. School-based co program coordination is, is old, it's no longer there. School-based decision making has been um, adjusted throughout the years. High priority school grants program no longer exists, et cetera. Okay. Cool. So the next piece is about um, the, the right to being informed about and participating in the education of their, um, um, their children and the opportunities to do so. There's parent rights and responsibilities, and so we um, notify parents annually um, in, a, in a series of notifications at the beginning of the school year about their rights. And then um, this component here is the, um, the new component that acknowledges the LCAP and also references the policy that you just uh, adopted. So now we're um, in sync. <laughs> um, and so it also includes the, um, the, the nod to one of the, um, the, the state priorities around parent and family engagement. And so um, the things that we are going to do directly to engage our families and then promote their participation, as well as additionally reaching out to our, our um, usually underserved families. And so we do have that in goal five of our LCAP. Cap. Do we need to include, it says foster, but not, it doesn't have homeless? So homeless is actually not in the statute. The homeless number comes in when we're looking at the numerically significant student groups. Okay. So in statute, the homeless students are not part of the unduplicated. Okay. okay. So this piece here, it's um, an adjustment to what previously existed around um, the, the superintendent or designee regularly evaluating and reporting to the board on the effectiveness of our parent and family engagement efforts. We embed that into the LCAP, and then we also do an annual um, parent survey. So the next piece here um, is old language regarding Title I schools. 
there's been a lot of rearranging in this plan, so some of the old stuff fell out. And then um, this piece um, we updated, and it was really about um, involving um, parents and family members of the um, Title I schools in particular when we're thinking about the Title I funding. So what this means is, um, the next paragraph, when the district's Title I Part A allocation exceeds the amount specified in blah, blah, blah. What the, what the requirement is, is any district that has 500,000 or more dollars of Title I must reserve 1% for parent and family engagement. And there are rules around what you can do with that 1%. The district can also keep a portion back or they can flow it all out to the school sites. So essentially this is reminding everyone of that requirement to reserve the 1% and then to um, adjust, uh, allocate that down to the schools for their parent and family engagement. And so the next piece here is outlining what can be done with those funds. So for instance, all of our Title I schools receive this funding. I can tell you the cost center. And each <laughs> one of them then has a dollar amount and they include that in their school plans and justification of what they have done in consultation with their parents around what they thought their needs were. And so these are options for the schools they can do things like work with um, nonprofit organizations or provide professional development. Um, they can do things like work with um, Parent Institute for Quality Education. So there's different organizations they can work with. They can also have programs to reach parents or families at home or in the community. This is around dissemination and information of best practices. So when you're thinking about how best to engage families, like perhaps in parent conferencing, or supports that parents can provide at home because they can't always come to school. And then um, possible collaboration with community-based or other organizations. And then um, any other, and this is the, the safety valve, any other activities and strategies okay. the district determines appropriate and consistent with the policy. So essentially what that's saying is the schools can't go out and get things that are completely outside of what would be mm -hmm. a normal, um, rational person would say um, parents would need to support, but we also have to acknowledge that the parents are the ones who also get to say what they need at the Title I school. <coughs> and just, just a clarification, um, the family members that were taken out in black, that was not part. This is all Correct. a new sec sec so, section. Yeah, oh, that's Everything interesting. Everything in red, so. That um, should have been red as well. I yeah. think that was part of our second pass. It should have been out. It should have just yeah. not even been there. Yeah. yeah. But I just don't want it, because I said before, because right. it can be yeah. confusing. OK. But you okay. did pretty good, Sherry, getting it all. OK. <laughs> And then lastly, this is a nod to the Title I schools. There are a lot more requirements about the Title I schools and around their parent and family engagement because there's money associated with it. Um, but this is also a recognition that our non-Title I schools still um, um, deserve the um, support of, um, of us and the guidance in terms of thinking about um, what they can do um, relative to parent and family engagement. And so we provide that support also through their school planning process. If you care to go to a school and look at the very last pages, their school plans um, include the parent and family engagement policies okay any comments or questions or suggestions about this policy that's exactly what I was going oh to sorry say. <laughs> that, no, that, and please take it away I'm fine <laughs> take it away. I've been here it's a long day um, move adoption of I board. do oh, oh, wait. Wait. <laughs> oh, I, think I didn't know if anyone else did Go ahead. what just push a button no there it is I did um yeah, this is part of the reason why I wanted, like, I'd, I know. there's just so much strike through. So, like, some of these things that, like, for me, I feel like the beginning part is really vague, like, where it's, like, developing meaningful opportunities, advisory roles, where activities. Are where are you? Where are you? From the very first paragraph, oh, that okay. part is vague. But then going through this huge strike through area on the top of B, where, like, this is really a lot more concise. And for a parent looking and seeing what is our policy on family engagement, we're talking about consulted and participate in the planning, design, implementation, and evaluation of the parent involvement or an engagement program. I feel like that is more empowering. And then the jointly developed piece right underneath, the superintendent or designee shall ensure that the district's parent involvement strategies are jointly developed with and agreed upon by parents of students participating. That, and then what the, the expectations are, I feel like that verbiage is missing from the pieces that precede it and are after it, like I think that's really specific. Where it's talk, is that somewhere else? Is that part of? So the great thing about our policies is we have policies and then we have admin regs. And so this is the what, this is the guiding philosophy and some of the requirements and then the admin regulations, that is the how. 
So some of those, like how we would expect that to be done, you don't really want in a policy. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be handcuffed by those things. But the requirements would be included here. So we would jointly develop a, a policy, for instance, but how we would get that done, whether it's committee meetings or representatives or forums, you don't really want that in a policy. So why was it there before then? So... Um, I mean, it seems I like this is really well written, well, and it seems like a lot to take out. I, I think I can exp explain a little bit um, through the process of how this how this comes about. Part of our member it's our, is our membership in CSBA, California School Boards Association, um, which is made up of the over the thousand districts, and we have a legal team up there, uh, uh, general counsel plus a whole raft, as well as groups that look at policies based on ed code, um, federal and state law, and everything else in between that. And so they write these policies for all the school districts that subscribe to the service, which is basically Thousand. almost all of them. Um, and then it's up to our individual districts to take those policies tailored a little bit to us, but because they're so keyed into all of, as you see in the back, the legal Edcom. references and everything, mm -hmm. so they're, they're, they are suggested policies, we tweak them, and that's what the committee sort of does, but then, then when we when we do any tweaking to them, then they go to our legal counsel mm -hmm. because they need to. We need to make sure that the language, if we want to take something out or put something in, it is still in compliance. So these policies are generally, if you go on to any school district in the state of California, you will probably see the exact same verbiage. Or pretty darn. My policy. concern is, I think that. For us specifically, these are areas of concern that I have with not seeing parent engagement strategies that are jointly developed. I think we're getting there, but so to take it out of the policy for me, I can understand at a state one? level, the, the top of B, the whole, those three the paragraphs that are. Sort of I, I think it's uh, also important to remember that it's no longer a no child left behind language, but as a language. So we can't refer to the old law. We have to refer to the new law. And if those are uh, those are uh, United States codes that are no longer in effect, the, that whole section gets uh, eliminated. That's helpful. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I, just, I think that it's written well, though. So I just yeah. I would like to see some of you know. Well, if, and if I you just look feel like that the joint piece of it is not a part of if, family if, engagement, really. If you look at the. Just take a look at the last time this policy was adopted on the very last page. At the bottom. Of ten, ten years ago. At the bottom. bottom ten left. years ago. Yeah. So we. So that's when no child left behind. So this is why these all require some adoption to well, because Dr. now Navarro we have. made a good point. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. But and it's I'm woven sure. throughout the entire policy that that parents are. <laughs> you know, a part of this. This is, you know, and they are a part of our LCFF as well. You know, I mean, we have to have them. It's the law. And maybe that's I, how it changed, because before we didn't have, have the LCFF. We didn't have the, we had, um, it had to be much stronger because the Title I part was not, or is it? This uh, Title I schools is <coughs> more important for that to be more concise because we didn't have the local <coughs> control um, right. plan. and well, accountability plan. And so um, if, if, if you, you look at it stronger, if yeah. you look at uh, on page B, the second paragraph, if you look at that paragraph, it says the superintendent of death that struck an out, oh, struck, okay. stra struck out. And because then you go not. to the third, the second red paragraph, they virtually say the same thing, only more. So it says here, he, Meaningful. she also <laughs> shall involve parents, guardians of participating students in decisions regarding how the district title won. And here it says the superintendent or shall involve okay. parents and participating in decisions regarding how the district's title one funds will be allocated for parent student engagement. So it's much more specific onto those those related. So they are I think that 
that while we struck them out here, they are embedded throughout in the new red. The ideas are included, yes. Yeah, yeah. I just like it's words that are like ensure rather than conduct. Yeah. I think to conduct doesn't really, is not a strong enough word, but. Well, shall, shall I mean, is shall a legal to, term for, no, no, <laughs> for we'll we will be involved. Conducting something or ensuring something is a yeah. very different, if we host an event and you don't talk to the parents, you're not ensuring that, the, I mean, it's a, that there's some big differences there. So and that's I think, why for me that I was, I, okay, I just so don't like the way that I think it could be much more intentional. And, and I think also knowing the, um, Administrative regulations are also available online with the, that's another set of binders, um, that when we have a question on something like that, it's, it, feel free to just go and see if there's an AR written to, because sometimes that does answer our questions. Well, so part but of this is for me also thinking thing. about making this easily disseminated to somebody who may not go mm -hmm. through all of that process. So if at some point we're making this like an infograph and this is something that parents can understand, if we take out some of some of the more clarifying pieces to it, I mean, most people are not gonna Perhaps go. it would help if you, uh, if I discussed how we employ these policies, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. Really these policies are for your administrators to hold our employees to the policies. So these are designed by law so that if let's say, for some reason we have a, a principal or uh, an administrator who's not doing this work, we can refer to this in the law and it's backed up by law and it's not Vanessa Gailey making it up. So mm -hmm. for us, this is a legal reference when we uh, talk about manage, making sure that everybody is doing what they're supposed to do according to the laws written in federal mandates as far as also as, also as well as, as uh, state mandates. So this is not a document that per typically gets used to, uh, we, would do th we would ask Annette and Adriana to do something different, to mm -hmm. make this, uh, put this in parent-friendly language mm -hmm. so that th their rights are, no are known. But for us, this is the legalese that we use if we have to with someone who's not doing what they're supposed to do under the st federal statutes. And those two paragraphs are also Ed Code and Federal Code. So I put a, I Put my light on. I just had a quick. Oh, there it is. Sorry. Bye -bye. Uh, I had a, just a quick question. So, for my education, when you reference Ed Code at the bottom and the Federal Code there, that means it's the old code. No, it. it you know, there's state law and then there's federal law. So it's so they're, here's our they're paragraph both. saying what our policy is, mm -hmm. referencing those two. So like that's Correct. more okay. Correct. So, and so uh, a couple other things to note. This also then guides the work that we do around school level policies. And um, of course, we're not going to, we don't intend for this policy to be the thing that's going to be a game changer for families. This guides our work. And then we want the schools and they're required to consult with families as they can, they work on their parent engagement policy. My experience has been this guides that work and parents typically care a lot more about what's happening at their school site. And that engagement piece of it. But again, it's that delicate balance of the policy behind the, the work and the, the relationship building like you're talking about. So this piece then allows us to guide the school level policy development. The administrative regulations will help us with some of the how. And then it's the relationship building is the, the experience the families will have. So coming up with a yeah, sort of a compromise, mm -hmm. can we, a paragraph number uh, that one right there, so red, the, the red, 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 the one. first red one. Yes. Can we say something like this, and can we write the, something that says the superintendent or designee shall ensure that parents slash guardians are involved in establishing expectations and objectives for meaningful, so that one we're ensure. I think going to address so, Ashley's is that we're ensuring that the superintendent and designee ensure that so parents are involved after in After seeing the exchanges between our attorney and our staff, okay. uh, I would tell you they would tell you not to change the language because it's based on the law. Oh, okay. okay. And because I looked it up, the, uh, sorry, <laughs> um, I should have been alert. Um, the, 20 USC 6318 mm -hmm. references the jointly. So if we're following that, even no matter what we put there, we're still following that. Right. As, 
Yeah. Whether, whether we clarify that or not. I'm just thinking maybe that's why the jointly used to be there mm -hmm. um, and why they just decided to simplify it because either way we are it's required in there. to do, yeah. Oh, okay. And, and I have to say, since I'm on the committee, um, you're gonna find more things that we took out because they're going into an AR because it was yeah. too detailed. Or, I mean, it was advised that we put this into an AR, that, um, that the, the policies are broad, but they address, not too broad, but they address the things they need to address. And, but I, I get what you're saying because, and Martha gets what you're saying because she's always trying to put a whole bunch in here and we're always <laughs> like now wait a minute <laughs> let's you know yeah I just I have a lot of concerns about this area and things <coughs> that could or should be happening and I think if our policy had stronger words and had a bit more to it like I want to empower our DUAC president to do a lot more and to have a lot more responsibility we don't have school site council in a lot of our schools on the west side like there's a lot of things that they have to they do <laughs> they're very, very, they're, they could be much stronger. I have literally, when I talk to people, they're like, I don't think I have one. So if parents don't think they have one, they're not getting involved and engaged. So, so I that think that we're, we're definitely talking about some of the how and some of the exactly. quality separate from the policy. And I, believe me, I agree with you. Mm -hmm. I, I'm <clears throat> passionate about parent engagement. I'm passionate mm -hmm. about engaging all of our parents and our families mm -hmm. and our guardians. Mm -hmm. And I think that a lot of the how is definitely something that we can continue to nurture and grow. We are by no means there. But in terms of this policy and what we need to set the foundation on, I think that it has what is required. And I think that it's um, just one of the components of of um, uh, what we do here for parent engagement. It's not the ceiling. Mm -hmm. I, and I think it's important uh, that uh, you know that mm -hmm. you uh, board members received this on February 14th. Uh, there was, there's time in there that you could actually make these, you could, we could actually, you could actually call us and we can have these conversations uh, with you, with all board members individually if you want. I mean, obviously we can't, have four board yeah, members, you know, yeah. on voting on it. But, but uh, the reason <laughs> we get it out is so that uh, board members have a time, to, a chance to look at it, and then contact me so we can get staff in contact with you, so that uh, an in-depth analysis or an explanation can be given. Uh, and and you can, and 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 there's a, there are a lot of legal reasons behind th these things. This and is why though I wanted to be on that team. I, this is how I am, this is how I'm wired, and this is really important to me, especially if the how is not in my purview. If the board's policy, if I'm not in charge of the how, and mm -hmm. I'm in charge of policy, these are things that are really important to me and like why I'm here. So I, I think that. I believe they're I important. Feel like my I believe hands they're, are but I believe little. you're saying exactly what every board member would say that these are important to everyone, and uh, we can't have more than three board members on, on the policy edit team. Uh, because that would be an illegal meeting. Uh, and so, you know, that's something that we'll have to discuss at a future board meeting on how right. we do that. I was that. just really dissuaded from being on it, and I knew that this would come up, so. <coughs> but well, but, we but again, there's opportunities. Time. There's yeah. opportunities. Let's go. Mrs. Black has a comment. That's um, it. Yes, I move to adopt board policy yes. 6020 A, B, C, and D in one reading, first reading. Is there a second? Second. Was that you, Karen? Thank you. Any further discussion? How important is, when are we coming up with the audit? The audit, uh, the last day to upload our documents is May 4th. <coughs> okay. okay, all those in favor of adoption on first reading? Aye. 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 Opposed? I'm Abstain. opposed. Abstain? Okay, 6-1, 6-1, 6-1, 6-1-0, 6-1-0, oh. board policy 6171. All right, this one is near and dear to my heart, Title I programs. And so uh, again, as in the others, the, the first statement is purpose and aspirational, and it's really about the kind of um, education we wanna provide to our students in the Title I schools. Um, and so this acknowledges um, essentially what the makeup is of our Title I schools and how they're economically disadvantaged students, and how the primary purpose of Title I is to strengthen academic programs and supply, to provide supports to students who are at risk of failing in those academic standards. 
This piece here is about supplements, not supplant. It's a cardinal rule of Title I funding, and essentially what it's saying is that we're going to acknowledge our state and local funds first, and then we're going to use the federal funds to supplement, supplement, supplement what is already there. And so the descriptions of how we're going to do this are included in both the local control and accountability plan and the LCAP federal addendum and any other document that the state would deem as a requirement. As a side note, the, the plan used to be called the Local Educational Agency Plan in capital letters. That was the name of the plan. But now it's really just, it's a thing. So that's why it's no longer um, an acronym and capitalized. But for all intents and purposes, our L Local Educational Agency Plan is the LCAP Federal Addendum. That's the new name of it. Okay. Any questions about these pieces? Mrs. Floor does. This is just a technical question, and I, I apologize. Do we ever define what what the what the feds and the state says is a large number or a, a or percentage of economically disadvantaged students? Do we ever the, say yes? There I are. Think there's, a is, is, there's a threshold. There's a threshold. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a minimum threshold. For instance, if you have 75 percent or more little education in Title One, for 75 percent more poverty, you must fund a school. And then what you do is you look at a district average poverty level, and you have to fund down to the average poverty level. Mm -hmm. And then depending on the amount of funds, you may be able to fund one or two more schools. Is that defined anywhere, or is it? Yes. Is yeah, is it's it in a quick, there. Is it a quick fact that we that when when we read this that somebody can say, well, I wonder what that what is a large number or percentage mean? It is a quick fact. I don't have it at my fingertips, but I can find you the the fiscal guidance. But is it on our website anywhere? No, we don't currently have the funding requirements on our website. So we don't we don't define what that means. We just we just say these are our Title One schools because we're we know that they have you know high percentage of low income, seventy five percent, whatever. Yes. We we don't currently have that posted. We don't have that funding formula or that rationale. But we do provide the justification and the backup in our state reporting. If that's something you're interested in, we could definitely I just talk think it's separately. Just a quick fact, because I think yeah. you know we throw these numbers out, but people don't realize right. what we're talking about because it could be as low as. 35 percent. 35 percent. And that would shock some people because they go, oh, my school's a Title I because mm -hmm. we only have, thir we have 35 yeah, percent. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think it bears us having a conversation about, right. you know, quick facts about Title but, I. But again, it's the district poverty level, so it's possible you're at 35 percent and not funded because we go right. through a process called ranking and serving. Right. Exactly. So. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right, moving on. Um, the segment in black Which, was. Black. No, no, no. I was ready to approve it. I already read it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I actually read it before. Yeah. So this next section is about the technical assistance we provide to the schools. And trust me, they get lots of technical assistance in their planning process and in their budgeting. And so that is what this is acknowledging here, that we have an obligation to support them through um, that entire process. And then, as you see here, in addition, the district and each school receiving Title I funds shall develop a written parent, guardian, and family engagement policy. And so, um, as I said before, it's included in all of our school <coughs> plans. And then um, we're, uh, we disseminate that through our um, registration process at the beginning of the year. I think this should be stricken through. What should yeah. be stricken? It, Looks to me like we have duplication sure. here that none of us sure. caught. Yes, we do. So yeah. either we don't need the you? new one or we yeah, I think delete the old one. I think the old one stands. Um, wait, I don't know how that happened. Different words because the other one says addition, parent, guardian, district. family engagement. So we delete uh, the bottom one. Delete the bottom yeah. one. Everybody get that? But you could be low. <sighs> Anybody else paying attention? Yeah, I no. think you have to strike yes. the black one. We, yeah. We, yeah, yeah, we strike the black one because the red one has the family engagement language. Where are you? Bottom of A. <laughs> okay. Sorry. That's, That's okay. okay. So this one we said we keep the red, we'd strike the pain. black. Okay? Okay. Page B. So this piece here talks about the local educational oh, yes. agency plan. Um, you'll notice later on that we talk about the LEA plan, right, I believe, later on. So um, again, local educational agency plan has been adjusted and is a new thing now. No, that's where I am. Okay. 
Comparability of services. This is an important um, um, component of Title I, and essentially what it's saying is that we are, uh, as a district, going to leave alone the state and local funding, and then the um, federal funds will supplement that, and that we are going to make sure that the, the um, general funding is comparable for all of our school sites. We're not going to short our Title I schools out of general fund and have um, the federal funding make up the difference. So we have to go through a series of processes to ensure comparability, and these are required in statute. So one of the things that we have to do is we have to adopt and implement a district-wide salary schedule. It was done long ago. This is reiterating the requirements. Okay. We have to ensure equivalence in teachers, administrators, and other staff as measured by either of the following um, calculations. And we do this calculation annually as required by law. Um, for your reference, the, um, the state requires it and the feds require it annually, but we only have to submit to the state every two years, and that's on a cycle. So these are the things that we have to do to ensure comparability. Okay, and it's straight from statute. <clears throat> We also have to ensure equivalence in the provision of um, curriculum materials and instructional supplies. So again, making sure that all of our kids have equal access to core. And then again, we're not shorting them for um, materials and then having the federal funds pick it up. Mm -hmm. And then we do maintain the records of quantity and quality of instructional materials and equipment at each school. Okay. This segment has not been adjusted, and this is about um, salary differentials in employment and unpredictable changes in enrollment and certain release valves in terms of when you're looking at the comparability. And again, at the beginning of each school year, the superintendent or designee measures this, and we typically do that October, November after the dust is settled. Okay. And this that, next that, sh that shows up in our budget? Uh, no, we don't so provide that. Comp it's a comparability. It's, it's a, a series of internal calculations that we look at to make sure that we're not out of whack in terms of having, um, you know, um, more money over here than over there. Who so. sees that? Do we see that ever? Uh, it's a compliance document that Vanessa has. Yeah, I work with Jeff's office on that. Okay. Participation of private schools. So this piece here is required in statute, and um, it is about... Um, Providing different services to um, schools, um, depending on if they um, have eligible students. Mm -hmm. And um, we do invite them for consultation every year. Um, and we, for Title I purposes, it's if students would have attended a Title I school. Okay, and so we reach out to them annually. Um, because it's possible that students don't only reside in our boundaries and then go to sc private schools in our boundaries, we also reach out to um, all of the nonprofit private schools in um, the surrounding districts as well. So I just want you to know that we do only? meet this requirement. Nonprofit, nonprofit only. For profit is not eligible. And at the CDE website, you can go and find all the private schools in the state and you can filter them by profit and nonprofit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In case you want to know. In your spare time. Okay, this piece here is about program evaluation, and so we regularly monitor the progress of our students in our low-achieving Title I schools. And during our annual evaluation, we address that, and we do call out um, results for our Title I schools in the um, body of the um, local control and accountability plan. And then we also have separate processes to review um, our Title I school data. I only have one wee tiny thing. Okay. <laughs> On the top of D. Um, I think it could be better if it re economically disadvantaged kids are not automatically low achieving students. So I think it would read better if it said economically disadvan uh, disadvantaged and or low achieving students. It makes it seem like they have to go together. I think that makes sense. I do too. That's all for Title I. Um, so in the first sentence at the very end, and first line. or first yes. line, yes. Got it. Okay. Motion. Mm -hmm. Move to approve or adopt. As amended. I'll second it. As amended. Great. <laughs> Waiting for a second. Okay. Miss Anderson <laughs> seconded it. Oh, in the first reading, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, any more discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? 7-0. Okay. 
All right, so my fourth and final policy of the evening, I'm actually gonna call a, a co-presenter up because I wanna make sure she can share the spotlight. So um, our fabulous English Learner Program Coordinator, Laura Dale Pash is here. Ooh. She's amazing, Ooh. and I'm very pleased that she's had a, a hand in updating this policy, our Education for English Learners. And so I'm gonna call her forward to um, help me go through here and answer any questions you might have. Okay. <laughs> so I'll, I'll start us off and then I'll have her jump in as needed. So um, we, again, the first paragraph, purpose and aspiration, and we really are committed to providing our English learners with challenging curriculum and instruction. We want to maximize their language proficiency and also recognize and acknowledge their multilingual capabilities. And um, we're looking at them being really included in our mm. core and in supplemental supports. And um, this next piece here talks about the LCAP, and of course we reference the now adopted um, new policy on the LCAP. And so um, this acknowledges our requirement to call out supports and services and goals for our English learners. Questions about these first two paragraphs? Um, sorry. Oh, go ahead, Ms. Barcho. Um, what's CF0460? That is the policy you guys just approved, the first one. So that's what the CF means is our internal policy? Uh, yeah, I don't actually know what CF means, Leona. Oh, we looked it up. <laughs> because you always know this stuff. <laughs> you don't, I don't need to know the exact, it was just more like, what's, what's my reference? I think it means reference. Yeah, I think yeah. It, it says check C0460. Uh, it's kind of what the translation is. Check reference. Yeah, yeah check reference. Yeah. yeah, I don't know what CF means. Okay. Right, I, I'm just, <laughs> yeah. where, where do I look? You know? Yeah, go, so the first, the first policy. Got it. In, in, in the document, when you get online, that's actually a live link. You just click on it, it'll take you there. Okay. Oh, that's cool. I'm Miss Anderson. Oh, I did Miss Anderson, you had your light. I didn't, sorry. Oh, good. Well, my one thing is these policies are not in Spanish, so I asked a few friends to look at them, and they were not able to because they're PDFs and they're not translatable. So that would be one thing for our education for English language learners. <coughs> our parents were not able to look at them and see. So when we met with our DLAC, we did translate them, and so when we worked with them and had those opportunities to speak with them, we do. So once this is approved, we'll post those. Great. Okay. Okay. Any okay. Uh, Moving right up. Sorry, I had one more tiny question. Oh, I'm sorry. It's not I a. Your light it's not just, a. Yes, I'm sorry. Just speak up. It's okay. <laughs> this is the time. It's one tiny change. It's actually no change at all. It's a question. Um, I assume we're putting the developing proficiency in English as rapidly and effectively as possible to maximize attainment because that's a language that's in the ed code somewhere. <coughs> I think if, if we hold your question, I think it reappears a little bit later towards the end of okay. the policy. So I think it's more of a structural change from CSBA. Thank you. So I think it comes up. All right, so the next piece is about the um, superintendent or designee encouraging parent and guardian and community involvement in the development and evaluation of our program for English learners. And I think if um, you saw the scope of the entire set of agendas for our DLAC, you'll see that every year this is um, addressed with them. And then additionally, we also have our ELACs looking at program evaluation and development at each of their school site programs. Questions about this? Okay. So um, this piece here is about um, differentiated English language development instruction, and this is really about the ideas of integrated and designated ELD, and what kind of materials we're going to use to support them. So we're also using the new language about integrated across all subject areas and aligned with the state content standards. That's language that aligns to our updated frameworks. I, you know, I need to say, I, I'm so excited about this change, because it really, instead of them just doing the drill constant, you know, it's requiring that they do the inquiry-based learning, critical thinking, and that means they're afforded, you know, when they're ready to go into all subjects instead of us just concentrating on the one. I know it takes longer and there's, you know, reason for that, but I really like that. I think that's, you know, and I think We're moving this, ahead. It, it acknowledges both, right? It that does, we want students totally. to have heavy access to core, and then we also mm -hmm. want to make sure that they are provided the language support at their proficiency level. Well, we've always been saying adequately supported to that 
you know, um, that they're that they achieve the results same academic le level as their English proficient peers. Well, <laughs> how do you measure that? You know. <laughs> And, and keep them individual human beings, you know, with their, you know, wonderful ways of learning. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so anyway, thank you. Okay. I'm awake. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This next piece is about teacher credentialing and um, the appropriate authorizations for teaching our English learners. I got the what to see. Oh. <laughs> Mrs. Bartow? No. Okay. Oh, I have one. Is there a reason why like, all no, of that no. was stricken out? I think that it's really important to have that we're looking for role models of language minority students. And it's not an ed code that's outdated. Do we, why was that taken out? <laughs> but it, I think it was, we talk, didn't we talk about that about it's in human resources somewhere in a policy about engaging in getting positive role models? In the ARs you mean? Your and it was actually Oops. talking about it in, in human resources yes, and employment Megan. possibilities. Megan's here. My memory isn't serving me well of exactly what policy, but there is a policy that it talks about all teachers being positive role models. For student, professional standards is one for sure. Code of ethics is another. Well, on the top of the... I'm just going to say, I, I believe that some of the pieces that are stricken are things that are... So there used to be, um, you know, only certain teachers had credentials to teach like English learners, yeah. just English learners in general. And now all teachers are required to have that yeah. certification. So it's it's kind of a moot point. They, they're they not hired if they don't have that um, credentialing. So that's stricken from there, as well as the focus is really on the professional development <coughs> in that. So that while teachers are coming in with a certain level of training, we're really our focus per policy is to really build through the professional development and take teachers from where they are and continue to help them grow. So I think that's the focus there. That makes sense. I just, this, I mean, specifically like at Pomona right now, they just hired a sixth grade male Latino teacher and the like students love him. So to take, I think the representation piece, so like I, this is really well written. I think that like, it's not just the training component, it's actually like this, this paragraph is really well written, actively recruited with attention to the importance of employing staff who could serve as role models for language minority students. I don't think we can do that. I mean, that are you saying that needs to be a minority? No, not needs to, a but it says shall be actively recruited. We might not always be able to have that, you know, I don't opportunity. Think you can, I don't think you can so, hire based on. It did. You yeah. can't. Um, yeah. You can cer certainly say things that are desired. You can't say a minority is desired. You can say bilingualism is exactly. a skill set that is desired. Yeah. Um, and but if it when it comes into any protected class, and we can't say we yeah, want you can't one. Say, yeah. Oh, not, yeah, I mean, one about the the other. Other. Even Isn't that what you that meant? Bilingual P yeah, I, oh. I just I, it's written well right here, the top of V. So. Okay. And by the way, for everybody's edification, I looked it up. Here it is. Because that's who you are. That's who I am. CF is the abbreviation or short for the Latin confer, comfortur, meaning compare, is used in writing to refer the reader to another material to make a comparison with the topic being discussed. There you go. Okay. It's referring us to another policy. <laughs> so could you repeat that, Martha? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Including the Latin. No, she shut her phone. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, can I make a motion yet? No, we're no. not. We have <laughs> <finished> <laughs> all you certainly can, but we will probably have a lot more discussions. Think, no, that was these my, are really well written. In that I mean, these are really yeah. well written. I, so, you know, yeah. they're so the best I've they've seen in 20 years. Uh, if if I may, on that first paragraph, um, the second part of that first paragraph is really included in the rest of the document. I agree. It totally the rest is. of it is. I just and like so, the... um, you know, I think that uh, CSBA attorneys make a recommendation of what isn't directly related to the purpose of this, of this, this policy. This is about instruction. Uh, and so really need to stick to what the instructional requirements are, the expectations are. Um, 
And so I, I would say that that doesn't really fit here. It would be much, something much better that we would put into uh, an HR policy. I think this first adequate number sentence would go beautifully right here in the middle of the page. Staff, underneath the sentence, staff development may also address the socio-cultural needs of English learners and provide opportunities for teachers to engage in supportive collaborative learning communities. So the only issue with that is the adequate numbers are not enough. We need to be at 100%. So this is written at a time, this old language, when we didn't have all of our teachers who had a credential that was the CLAD and now is embedded. So adequate numbers of qualified teachers and support staff yeah. isn't enough. Like they all either have the credential or they don't get through. Yeah. So I, I okay. hear what you're saying about yeah. wanting to have the adequate staff, but it's, it's, it should be a, a moot point at this point. Um, and I do think the intention is more around that staff development and wanting to make sure that we're still providing that robust staff development on behalf of our English learners. It seems to me like that's the, the focus okay. that we're trying to enhance. So, um, okay, so um, moving on, uh, <coughs> there is this piece about additional staff development and addressing the sociocultural needs of the students, and then the possibility of providing mm -hmm. adult literacy that helps um, the adults around our students um, with <coughs> English fluency, and notice that that is a may, not a shall. Which where? The, mm -hmm. um, the, to support students' yes. English language development, the superintendent or designee may provide. Okay, we're going to move on to identification and assessment, and this is really all about the policy of what we are required to do to identify English learners in our district, and the things that we have to do when we assess their proficiency in the required areas of listening, speaking, reading, and writing. And then the next paragraph is about how we have to annually assess students for language proficiency until they're reclassified according to um, the criteria in our district. It's a requirement. They can't wave out of it. All right, and so um, this next piece is about their um, achievement in the core content areas, and then they're assessed by all of their required assessments in our California Assessment of Student Performance and Progress. And then there is that one caveat that students who are newly arrived do not have to take the assessment in English language arts. Um, uh, just note that they do have to take the mathematics one, and. Um, that's within their first 12 months of attending a school in the United States. Even though the mathematics is now all Even though mathematics is now very right. language-based, yes. And then uh, this next piece talks about formative assessments that can be used, and this is basically the in the moment in the classroom teaching supports. Hmm. Questions? Okay, we're gonna go to language acquisition programs. All right, so this piece here is about offering research-based language acquisition programs, and that's really the, the goal of getting students to be able to be reclassified. And so there's different ways that we can do that. And so we have to offer, at minimum, a structured English immersion program, which basically has, as I mentioned before, designated and integrated ELD. We have designated ELD, which is separate and targeted toward language proficiency at the students' levels. And we have integrated ELD, which occurs throughout all the content areas and that is supportive of the student's language. So um, the next thing that you have is um, a description of structured English immersion in the, the curriculum and program <coughs> design. And then um, a clarification, right, of what structured English learning or immersion means with nearly all um, of the instruction being conducted in um, English, although you're allowed to support some in primary language. And that's the exceptions there. All right. Hmm. This next piece is about what we may offer according to statute, and that is dual language immersion programs, as well as foreign language instruction, and some different approaches that can be used when um, providing additional settings. Any questions around I that? I like that. I think that's great. Okay. <laughs> All right. So. Um, when we um, establish our, our language acquisition programs, we have to consult with parents, guardians, and community members, as well as administrators and teachers. And so when you think about that, you're thinking about the establishment of um, all of our programs, whether we might expand. And then um, at the beginning of the school year and upon the student's enrollment, parents are informed about what kind of programs they can enroll in. And that takes place in our annual notification letters that go out in English and Spanish within the first 30 days of school. Those, assess, those letters, by the way, reiterate the student's scores on the most previous LPAC assessment. And then it also says, here's your program placement and here are your options. Oh, great. Okay. 
All right. Um, a parent can choose to opt out of a language acquisition program. So when you're thinking about this often as like a secondary student who they say, you know what, I just, I don't want them in designated ELD. I don't want them in designated ELD. Then they have the um, ability to say that they want to opt out of that particular kind of program. Okay. Reclassification, this is the piece here where um, essentially what we're saying is the students have met their criteria and they can be transferred from having to have designated ELD to all being mainstream. Okay? So that first paragraph, um, an English learner, that's all new, correct? Uh, I want to say it was reclassification. I think the black right? should have just one of those okay. don't show just up. Just making things. sure because. On my original, it's all red because that's the way we were yeah. doing it then. Okay. I, I, I just want to make sure. Okay. It was a clarification thing. It didn't get completely struck and yeah. updated right. Okay. It's in a, that's okay. Yeah. yeah. All right, and then this is a more robust explanation of program evaluation that needs to be included when we're reviewing our program. And so, of course, this is all red, it's all new. So we're looking at um, progress in English learners and proficiency in English. That would be the um, LPAC, English Learner Proficiency Assessment for California. And then the number of percentage of English learners who reclassified. So we have all of that data at our fingertips. And then also we're looking at not just our students who are English learners, but who are long-term English learners. Students who've been long-term are more than six years. So these are the components that we'll have to include when we're doing our program evaluation. So go Vanessa, ahead. can I yeah. go and just ask you another question just to explain it? Again, once more for me. Yes. And you know exactly where I'm going. I do. I'm sure. BP 6174, page D. Okay. Back Second to, to the last paragraph where it says, parents of guardians of English language may choose a language acquisition program that best suits their child. Correct. To the extent possible, any language acquisition program requested by the parents, guardians of 30 or more students at a school. 30 or more or by the parents, guardians of 20 or more students at any grade level, doesn't say whether it's at one school or multiple Shall be schools. offered by the school. Sh and the word is shall. The, the yep. question I have that it must be done, whether it's economically feasible, we have the high quality teacher to teach that specific language if in fact there are 20 or more and it doesn't specify at a school it just possible. says 20 or more at any grade level so i'm reading i'm going wait a minute here so i, I and this is just a clarification it says 30 or more students at a school got that one that's easy but then or by 20 parents or guardians or, or of any grade level and are at we, a school. You is want, it, at a should school. It, shouldn't it be at a school? Because the, all I can think of is 20 or more students anywhere in the district gets together and says, I want to offer Farsi. So there's two ways to read this, which is mm -hmm. 20 or more students at any grade level shall be offered by the school. Mm -hmm. So that's the whole sentence. Mm -hmm. Or you could add it, which would be redundant, but maybe beneficial in this case. So it would read, um, to the extent possible, any language acquisition program requested by the parents guardians of 30 or more students at the school, or by the parents guardians of 20 more students at any grade level at the school, shall be offered by the school. I, I just, <laughs> Which I we, just can, we, can, we can absolutely add it for clarification. And I guess the question is the shall. The question is the shall, because I get sort of nervous when, a, when it's a must, that it, and fiscally and financially, if if you got third, you've yeah. got a high concentration of of a la, of a language that yeah. we have a cluster of students. I mean, we know right. that we have the largest Marshallese um, Pacific Islanders in Costa Mesa outside the Marshall Islands. Now, given if they ago. if they speak Marshallese, I don't know. But they're specific. So, I mean, economically, if they request and said we want a classroom, or but isn't a school, it Ed Code? So, I think so that's this is Ed, shall I just want to make sure. So that's why the shall is from Ed Code as well as to the extent possible. So you hit on a point okay, okay. for a qualified teacher. So, for example, say we have the financial means, we have the the number of students. They're all in one grade level, one little package. But if we can't find a credential qualified teacher. Okay then that 
Okay. That's not to the so it's to the extent so possible. Then we can't. We have to use the word shall, mm -hmm. but that is we straight clarify from it with to the extent mm -hmm. possible. Which word says it? Both. So basically, we try within our means to make that happen. But there, you know, maybe there's a financial issue that we're not able to provide that program. Maybe there's a facility issue. There could be a variety of things. So okay, all right. I'm we do I'm everything also... possible to offer it, but. We don't have to offer it if okay. it's not possible. That's all I wanted to know. But okay. I'm okay with adding at a school Ooh. in that little section I, because just that, in case so someone sorry. else would read it and think that, okay, there's five at Paula Reno and seven here and 12 at College Park, that's 20. So, it's clear. So, it's clear by the I think it's pretty clear. If it's cl I'm okay. okay. I'm okay if you think it's. I, I'm, I mean, it's been around so long that Smith, I know that I just want to make it really redundant. clear that it, we, yeah. we're, okay. we're talking about 20 <laughs> okay. at one specific cool. school. Okay, Martha, that's five. You don't get any more questions. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> okay, now we're at program evaluation. <clears throat> oh. I just wanted to point out, Ms. Bartow, that the it's under language. Yes, Did you find you. it under yes. language acquisition programs? Yes. Okay, that so piece I, comes the, back. The, what, yeah, where it struck out, it was just replaced in a different section. Yeah, they just mm -hmm. organized it, it differently. Thank you. Okay, that's cool. Thank you. Okay, and we're done with it. <laughs> Any more discussion? Motion, please. So moved. Mrs. <laughs> Waving the second adoption. Mrs. Floor <coughs> moved second. I second. Ms. Bartow seconded it. All those in, oops, any other discussion? I said, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Abstain? 700. Okay. It has been a distinct pleasure to serve you this evening. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much, Ms. Thank Poor you. Thing. <laughs> She's so all of your colleagues are just envious that they don't all get to talk about it. Yeah. But Dr. Jockham is right here to enlighten us. Yes, yeah, she is. Good evening. All Good right, evening. we're going to do this section a little bit differently. Is um, we don't want to be here till midnight. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm going to go through the policies, and you tell me if you have questions instead of going them. through them, because okay. you should you all have received them. Right. The committee looked at them. So we're going to if you have any questions, please ask, and we'll we'll. Um, We'll go through them. So we're going to start with 3541.2, which is transportation for students with disabilities. And just as a um, little bit of background, um, this was also reviewed with our transportation department so they could weigh in on any of the um, services there on, on or anything in the board policy. So um, do we have any questions on that board policy? Do not. All right. Pretty seeing quiet. seeing it's none. Beautiful. I do want to include cats versus dogs and miniature horses. Yes. Oh, okay. I, you know, I, I always <laughs> highlight that you can bring a service animal on a school bus, <laughs> and it can be a dog or a miniature pony or a miniature <laughs> horse. <laughs> but that's it. That's all you get for service animals. So. No peacocks. Um, <laughs> do we have Do we have a motion to approve? So moved. With on second. first on first reading question. Yes. Okay, it's been second. moved and second by Karen. Karen. Okay, we'll let Karen do it. Um, yeah. Okay. <coughs> it's been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Okay. All right. All oh, right. We, now this. we got the rhythm, right? We got the motion. And I'm awake again. All right. <laughs> this is great. Board policy 4222 <laughs> is regarding teacher aides or paraprofessionals. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you'll see that this is just basically uh, a little cleanup. There's not a lot of changes to it. So is there any questions or clarifications needed? Well, I think there should be, there's a clarification on one, on the first page, the one, two, three, four, five, six paragraph where we are actually striking um, with an assistant. Yes. So we wanted to make sure that that's, because we wanted we wanted teachers to effect, get training on how to effectively collaborate with everyone. Yes. That's, yes. To, that, that's the clarification of why it just says why, an assistant. Right. Yeah, why, it, okay. why we took out the assistant. Any further discussion? Move approval. Second. On first reading. On first reading. Mrs. Floor moved, Mrs. Black seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain. 
Okay, moving right along. Look, I'm, I'm behind. Let's move on along here. Uh, we have board policy 6173, which is our education for homeless children. Um, and so this one had a little bit more changes to it, but some of it was just a rearrangement and some of it was just to clarify things a little bit more. So were there any questions or clarifications needed in this policy? I thought this was good. I thought they well, this is an example of this one part we took out and added to the AR under transportation, that whole piece. Right. Yes, we that, added that, that to the That AR is correct. That's the how, so it's in the, yeah. um, it was moved to the administrative right. regulations. Exactly. Yes, and we noted that, and that was good that you noted that. On <laughs> it's moved, moved to adopt in first reading. Mrs. Black moved, seconded. I'll second. Mrs. Bartow seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Wee. You know how to work with children. <laughs> Are you Or Vanessa notes? got you all tired <laughs> out. I, I know. know. I was going to say, don't you feel left out. You feel left out. Yeah. <laughs> we tired of her out. Yep. All right. So um, let's see if we can get the, um, I don't know what four in a row is. Not a trifecta, but a quad. Quad something. Quadfecta. Let's see if we can. Uh, we have the board policy 6173.1. And this is uh, education for foster youth. So this is a policy we've also reviewed with Sarah Coley as she is our um, homeless and foster liaison. Um, so any questions or clarifications? I have a question um, oh. on B. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Good for Good you, for you Ashley. Yeah. Oh, right. She was gonna fly through the right. Yeah, sorry. I was getting um, too cocky, wasn't I? Okay. Make her work for it. <laughs> Well, there's just some interesting strike throughs. Like, so what is the rationale for what the strike throughs are? And then it sounds like this paragraph is only talking about like the money piece of it. And so I think it could be nice to include like to address the needs of foster youth and help ensure the maximum utilization of available funds and wrap around support. Like, so it's not just, it sounds like it's only about the money. Um, and then also that sentence that was Where stricken from it also kind of is in that verbiage. So I kind of wanted to know why that was. And then why nonprofits and advocates, specifically I was thinking about CASAs. We would oh, want to be partnering with that. CASAs for foster youth. So that's why I just had some questions about that section. Sure. So the um, this the section is primarily dealing with money, so that's why it's kind of called out in there. Mm -hmm. And if you where where the first strikeout is, and to support the edu educational needs of foster youth, it's it's just worded funny. So that's why yeah. that was taken out. It, it isn't intended to um, to change the meaning at all. And I, when we talked about taking out nonprofits and advocates, we just um, we wanted to open it up to um, why why would we only deal with nonprofits or only deal with advocates? So I think that was is that does the edit talk about you remember add something that? else in? It, it was also because we felt that we we are required to work with the, the law people, the, the, law people, the right. legal people. Yes, yes. But, but we don't we're not required, required. to work. And we do. You were putting that right. in an AR or something. Yes. So you shall collaborate when you look at the. Um, uh, we're, we have requirements to deal with social services, probation, and juvenile court officers, but there's no legal requirement for us to work with nonprofit organizations or advocates. So that's why it's, it's taken out of the shall, and we are going to be putting language into the AR that defines these different groups that we work with. Because we know we work with them. That's not a, we, um, you know, we love our nonprofit partners and we definitely need to work with our CASAs and all of those people for our students. Okay. Any other questions? That makes sense. Cool. Motion? <coughs> Move to approve oh, board okay. policy 6173.1 and first reading. Second. Second. Mrs. Yell, moved by Mrs. Black, seconded by Mrs. Yelsey. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? 
Ooh, she left even before we finished the boat. No, I was just one. I love drones. Yeah, okay. this was a fun one. Done? Yes, we are. I was just do laughing. Need, do you need some help moving I, drones I forward? Could, I could. I can do could. that. <laughs> My drones. husband lost his drone over the weekend. I was going to save oh. that for my report. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, so it disappeared. It went so you know, decided to take off. You get closed I forget what my report is. Sorry. Sorry. No. Okay. We're, we're losing that people. I know. It's, it's late, but we can do well, it. We've, we've only got been two sitting policies. here for five hours. It's not a problem. We, we do, do this jump into right. easily. We have now entered the era <laughs> of drones. And I want to give a little history about how we um, arrived at, at uh, creating this policy and, and bringing it to you uh, for consideration as a new policy. Um, uh, actually, uh, several months ago, uh, Michael Vossen, who you heard from earlier, uh, through a request of a couple of his teachers who are now teaching uh, flight and space and aerospace and engineering, uh, had the idea that at some point they would like to be able to use drones as part of their instruction uh, for these courses. It makes sense that at some point that's what they would be using. So, uh, so the request came to me that, uh, is that okay? And I said, well, you know, I don't know. We looked at our policies and obviously we did not have a policy in existence. So I looked, uh, checked in with legal counsel and asked if an existing policy had existed. And at that point, it had not existed for any um, school district. And so we started creating our own policy based on policies at the university level and, and piece that together. And in the end, um, as we were doing this, we determined, uh, Sherry determined, that CSBA was creating a policy, a template policy. Mm -hmm. So we uh, utilized the resources of CSBA as well as our own legal counsel to create uh, this policy that's before you today. So uh, the other thing, is not only for instructional reasons, but when I brought this up in cabinet, our uh, colleagues in the business division said, you know, that policy is actually very uh, important for work that they might do either as employees who need to utilize drone technology for any operational purpose uh, in the district or uh, us hiring a third party a vendor or company to do some drone work. And I believe that our district has a, a really strong vested interest to have this policy. I believe our community and residents would be very pleased to know that we have regulations and policies <laughs> uh, related to drones that we might be flying some may, some in, uh, their, yeah, or, yeah, in the neighborhood or particularly over our uh, property. So with that, mm -hmm. we've created this policy and you'll notice that at the beginning, uh, this does talk about it's for instructional program and district operations and it's to maintain safety, security and privacy. Uh, for our students, visitors, and of course our residents as well. Uh, so I'll kind of take the lead with uh, Sarah. Is there any questions um, on this policy that you uh, would like to ask? So rockets aren't included because they want waiting lists. <laughs> I have one short one. It sounds like, um, so like the fourth paragraph down, that district employees operating must have authorization to, I think maybe in, in A? In A, yes, like near the bottom. It could, oh, there it, is. it could have something about authorization from their principal, nowhere in the drone policy. There's lots of talk about the district employees, but not them connecting to their principal. So uh, the, the uh, approval process is going to be a combination of our <coughs> business division as well as the uh, educational division. Obviously, if it's an educational purpose, we're going to have our ability to approve or deny it. If it's a business operational, uh, it would be in the business office. But the, the AR will specify how they go through the Correct. approval Correct. There, there will be accompanying AR and there will be district standardized forms <coughs> that will require them to submit what their purpose is and will have the appropriate signatures. And the major part of that piece is to include the FAA and we have extenuating FAA circumstances because of John Wayne Airport. Yeah. It's amazing. Just ask, the, mm -hmm. just ask the families of Mariners yes. School. <laughs> and Dana. <laughs> and Joe Defense. We have them. They're, they're going around our house and around the field. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> I don't know who's doing them, but. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
But they're, it's yeah, probably they know my husband. Probably once a week, we'll, we'll, we'll hear it. I'll be out in my <laughs> yep. Yep. garden. Do we have there. any pertinent discussion? No, excuse no, me. No, I, I think it's great. <laughs> On the drum. I'm just getting tired, people. You can tell where my, my long day has been. Okay, I move to approve um, board policy 3515.21A through whatever. And <laughs> on the first reading. On the first read. Second. Mrs. Floor seconded it. Mrs. Black motioned. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Abstain. Okay. Okay, next we have uh, board policy uh, 4157, 4257, 4357 regarding employee safety. Uh, if you recall, uh, several months ago I brought a whole set of safety mm -hmm. policies forward uh, that were approved. Uh, this one got left out. We wanted to bring this back. You'll notice that the only change is updating governing board to board of education and updating the date. So moved. No, no changes. Second. Any discussion? Hmm. Just a minute. Okay. <laughs> I agree. There's no changes. All nope. good. All good? Mm -hmm. All good. Okay. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Yippee skippy. That was on the first reading, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fair? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Get to read um, this. Mrs. Black seconded. <clears throat> Okay, thank you. Sorry, <laughs> we're, we're not done yet. I know, the Ginsu knife part. Community input on non-agenda items. Take it, Mrs. Black. Sorry. Really? Okay. This is an opportunity for the public to address non-agenda topics within the subject matter jurisdiction of the board. Per board policy 9323, each individual speaker will have three minutes. Speakers may not cede unused minutes to other speakers, and there is a maximum of 20 minutes <coughs> of comments per topic. With board, <coughs> with board consent, the president may increase or decrease the time allowed for public comments, depending on the topic and the number of persons wishing to speak. In compliance with board policy in the Ralph M. Brown Act, the board is not permitted to take action on non-agenda items. When addressing the board, it is helpful if you state your name and address for the video record. Mr. Logan, thank you for being so patient and waiting. I was just going to ask one more time, but I figure I won't. <laughs> <laughs> no. Very funny. Uh, good evening, board, superintendent, expected guests. Wow. Oh, let me f I'm so tired, I'm forgetting who I am. <laughs> Gary Logan, CSCA, a maintenance and operations employee. Yeah. Well, career education pathways, wish I could add classes like that coming I from know. the M&O department. Oh. I think yeah. we're going to be lining up a bunch of new employees for later on. <laughs> More members for CSCA. That's so great. Uh, now that February is nearly over, one of the, radiest, <clears throat> one of the wettest years on record. MNO was there with pumps and carpet vacs to remove water and keep the schools open and moving and fix things as fast as we could to keep the classrooms and everything open. We didn't have to de deploy any pontoons. <laughs> uh, in the next few weeks, CSEA will start negotiations, hoping for cordial and respectful communications on both sides. And that ends my report. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very Thank much. You. Here, here, and thank you for all your hard work over there with maintenance oh, with the yeah. rain because and the rain may not be over. The rain, is, well, yeah. We're some still, people get trials by fire. Yeah. We had trials by water. Well, <laughs> that's what they were saying. This was like the, the coldest year on record, and right. like one of the coldest Februarys yep. for uh, in like thirty or sixty years. What plus one of the wettest and. Yeah. And yeah, the yeah, areas of our district that are yeah. a little bit below gray. I think it's the first February ever that a temperature has not reached 70 degrees. Yeah, we, we Just heard that today. Oh, well, it's raining down. tomorrow, according to um, it's Dallas. It's going to just think about rain. <laughs> Hush, no, it's going to rain on the things. weekend. Okay. Good evening again. Um, so I wanted to give a few reports on some activities that have happened uh, recently for CFT and some actions that we've got. So. Uh, last week, uh, NMFT had two members participate in a lobby day uh, where uh, the members of my team were able to meet with local legislators 
and talk about some different um, um, priorities that CFT has, uh, one of which is related to charter schools, and we were fortunate enough to, to be present when SB 125 was having a Senate hearing on charter school transparency, and two weeks ago, that bill did not even have a number. So I believe that there is quite a bit of resolve within the legislature to fast track some charter school reforms so that we have uh, comparable uh, oversight of charter schools as we do um, in our public schools. So that was pretty amazing to, to witness something going through the legislature that quickly and it's something we may wanna pay attention to. Um, also last week, um, I participated with a few other CFT officers where we are starting to visit the local new congressional candidates, uh, sorry, uh, congressional members mm -hmm. uh, who were recently elected. And we're wanting to highlight for them the needs for federal support for Title I uh, funding, uh, for appropriate funding for CTE programs and for college community services, especially in the community colleges as well and student debt programs. Uh, so thankfully, uh, because of the excellent work that Mr. Trader has done, it's easy for me to find those numbers <laughs> and use it as evidence to say, this is what Title I funding used to be like, and this is when it went down, right. and this is what the unfunded liability is for, for various programs that we have needs. And uh, you know, Congressman uh, Cisneros was very receptive uh, mm. to our presentation, and I know that we have a, uh, a, a meeting scheduled in Two weeks, I believe, with uh, Congresswoman uh, Porter. Um, we're trying to get the other um, members uh, scheduled as well. And then uh, finally, I wanna speak to the Isaac uh, School um, presentation that was done at the County Board of Education. And I just want to applaud this board, uh, Mrs. Matoye and all of the past presidents who are present, Mrs. Floor, Mrs. Black, Mrs. Yelsey, and Mrs. Snell, for keeping our process open and extending time when needed for the public to be able to have comment. It was extremely disheartening that that process was not carried at the county board. Uh, we are encouraging our members to make sure that they are writing the board members, uh, that they are contacting them and asking for denial. Um, I spoke earlier today at the NMFT retired lunch and at making that same ask. Uh, so uh, I know the board has done their part, the administration has done their part, we're trying as well, um, and maybe it will make a difference. Great, thanks for that. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you. It was a very nice plea to the retired teachers. Alrighty, board member reports. <clears throat> just please just keep in mind how late it is. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Snell. No report. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> I just have two very shorts. Um, so this Friday is Dr. Seuss Day, so I'll be going to Wilson Elementary in Victoria. Mm -hmm. um, and then on Monday, I get to be a part of um, the Ray Parent Group is having their graduation. So I'm very excited. Oh, hey, They've been working really hard. Hey, Mrs. Bartow. <laughs> um, I have this very short. I'm just excited that today I hit my 11th principal meeting. I'm trying to Good hit all you. 32 <laughs> by April and I'm on track to do it. So all right. Go girl. Good Good you go. No report. I have a report, but I'm going to save it till next time um, on our, um, our student advisory because we'll be meeting by then and we'll have some more input. And they were really excited about thought exchange and our DLAC as well. So um, We'll find out when we do the follow-up on that. No report. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, you that guys are great. I just have, I have one. 50, you just what? have 50. Well, you guys don't left me all the time. Um, Dr. Navarro <laughs> did a summary, I'm passing them down for you, of the requests that board members made on the last one um, and the last board meeting, things that were going to be happening. And the disposition is there for you to take notes on when it gets handled, right? Well, this is something I, uh, with uh, your board bylaws that I meet with the board president and we decide which ones uh, we can uh, move forward with immediately and which ones maybe we'll have to wait. But the, they won't be disregarded, they just can't be working on right away. So if anyone has anything to say. I think we need to read it. That's fine. That's yeah. cool. Yeah, contact yeah. me. I'll contact you. Contact me. The last thing is from one Charlene to another. Charlene Ashendorf, who is a community volunteer, dropped off Love Costa Mesa t-shirts to the entire mm. board. Yeah, nice. And it's a save the date, Saturday, May 18th. 
for the second annual Love Costa Mesa Day. It's a community-wide volunteer service day for Costa Mesa. Businesses, churches, agencies, schools, and city halls will work together to serve the city. Last year, more than 300 volunteers and 20 projects made a positive impact on our neighborhood schools and nonprofit. Spread the word, we need projects to be identified. So if you have a, something specific, get back to Mrs. Ashendorf or the city. We need volunteers of all ages, individuals, groups to participate. We need leaders to oversee community projects. We need support sponsors okay, to support materials. <laughs> So to get information or register at lovecostamesa.org. And she said, thank you for sharing the information with the, with the board and thank you for distributing the shirts um, for Love shape. Costa Mesa Day. And I will get this to our public information officer to see if she can spread the word even further. Okay. Informational reports. Dr. Navarro. I've spoken enough, thank you. <laughs> I, 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 I have oh, committee reports. Oh, committee. oh, that's true, Mrs. Flora. Thank you. And, and we have a CTE advisory committee report. And I have. They gave I, it. Thank I think you, we Mr. Had Lawson, it for doing that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and Mrs. Cor Mrs. Flora, crop away. Crop away. <laughs> I am handing you out. Uh, go ahead. Oh, I think there's an app. Okay. There's an app. It's not Amy. Um, I'm handing you out a couple of things. One is that's the labor study report. Um, it's it's fairly great reading. Uh, I have lots of charts. Cards. Well, it's lots of charts, but I think it's it's fascinating because up at the very top it talks about, and this is required. So this is our this is for Orange County, and you saw this from mm -hmm. Michael Vossen. But if you turn, there's a great infographic here about it. And then if you look, all of the industry sectors are here, and at the very top are the classes that are being offered. And they also identify which are UC um, accredited. And then it talks about the, oh, the, the cost and the hourly report and everything. Okay. But I just wanted to give you um, just a brief update on a couple of things. One is that um, the one of that disposition is they are trying to set a date to meet with all the, the superintendents of the five schools, the CBO, and the CTA or whatever representatives at um, the schools to talk about a new funding model. And that's going. Um, uh, Deborah Fry, who, is, who, who has been doing the presentations, um, explained that ours is sort of really wacky and we're very unusual from from other uh, ways that they've been funded. And primarily that's because we've only had like two super, maybe three superintendents and it was all built on relationships with Paul Schneider and, and sort of that. So it's all getting worked out, we hope, but they're gonna be meeting. And I think now you said the, de the dates now. I think it's March 29th. My, March 29th, so we're working on that. Uh, just to give you an idea of what's going on with the labor, um, it's increasing across all industry sectors, but the building and construction trades is, is highlighted. It's grown between 2010 and 2018 by 52.7 percent. Um, we just adopted the new, um, we're going with the BIDA program, which is the Building Industry Trades, Trades Association, which is a non-union organization. I didn't know this, but it takes 1,200 different skills <coughs> and jobs to build one house. 1,200 skills and jo jobs. Um, so we're very excited because Duane um, has used their curriculum before and so we're gonna be doing that. Um, so we'll be one of two school districts that have it in existence. We'll be, um, Creekside is gonna be starting it in Irvine and then we will have it. Um, the interesting thing that's also coming out is the automotion, automation and outsourcing is decreasing in demand. So all of those business and finance like bookkeeping, accounting um, is stable, but tellers, and I think you've all read the paper, that bank tellers, they're now going to the automated system, so there's a decrease in, in banking. And um, a lot of outsourcing and computer programming is de decreasing because they're sending it overseas which I think is fascinating. 
And then um, there's a steady increase in patient <laughs> care. Those are the three industries that are really, really highlighting and, and moving forward. So uh, we're rapidly um, providing opportunities. And so take a look at that study, and That's hopefully great. we'll be bringing Hoping more stuff. Hoping we're giving our kids some of those 1,200 skills so that they can get yeah, jobs. 1,200 different skills, yeah. Exactly. OK. This is also no report. Yeah, exactly. No report. No report. Yay. No report. No report. Oh, man. Do Move to, to adjourn. <laughs> OK. Yeah. All those in favor, yay. Yay. Out of here. <laughs> uh -huh.